the Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball. Right, you're very welcome along. It's Wednesday and it's OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. We're with you live as per usual until 10 o'clock this morning. Nathan Murphy is with me this morning. Morning, Nathan. Morning, Shane. And Kathleen McNamee is here as well. Good morning, Kathleen. Good morning, guys. How are we keeping? Uh, I guess we should start with some matters. I know we've loads coming up, by the way, between uh, now and 10 o'clock. We'll have a treat. Tommy Welch, live in studio from 8 o'clock. So we uh, obviously get a lot of coverage from Tommy at matches, but uh, nice to have him in studio and we'll do a bit of a hurling state of the nation on the year so far and look Look ahead to this weekend's two big hurling semi-finals. We'll have Alan Quinlan in the 25, uh, talking the other 20s. Of course, they've dealt with a, a tragic week um, with the Irish 20 squad, knowing the, the two young lads who were uh, killed in the Greek island. And then, of course, uh, one of the playing squad, uh, father passing away on, on that trip as well. Uh, Stacey Flood will be with us at 8.50. A uh, well, member of the Irish Women's Seven Squad will be heading off to the Olympics. Jason Quigley joining us at ten past nine to talk his latest uh, exploits uh, and where he goes from here, I guess, as well. And Brendan Devaney highlights from last night's uh, OTP PM from half past nine as he discussed Derry and Monaghan's uh, um, adventure uh, this season and heading to the All Ireland semi finals. Is that another record that we're like 20, 30 seconds into the show and you've got your first mention of Monaghan in already? That is it? It's not bad. I mean, oh, we're delighted for you. The whole nation is delighted that the, the underdogs are going to get uh, a chance gone, against uh, the dubs. This is not what you were saying in the crappy quiz last week. I was getting dogs abuse. Listen, but well done. Gee, you Nathan, this is the first time you've been on since Sunday. How are you feeling? I'm all right. I'm, I'm, were you calm. At the game? I'm calm about this. No, I was, um, I was down in Spiddle, mm. camping in the um, beautiful weather in Spiddle. I tell you, it was bloody Baltic. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm all in on camping. It's usually fine. A couple of glasses of wine. Of tent a, camping, this is. Tent camping. Oof, tent camping. Yeah. It was the coldest I've ever been camping. Yeah. It was absolutely Baltic. Need a good that tent. didn't help my mood uh, on Sunday afternoon. Did you watch the game at least? Oh, I did, yeah. Yeah. I was in um, in the pub in the main street in Spittle. Lovely. There was a few Mayo folk around who were sort of slowly moving out the door as the second half went on, but I stuck to the bitter end. Yeah, I think the game went, I won't say as expected, but there was definitely a sense that... Uh, we kind of knew where Mayo were but we didn't know where the Dubs were and if the Dubs when you looked at that 26 were as strong uh, in reality as they were on paper if they could get back to their very best that Mm. Mayo would be in a lot of trouble and I think that's sort of how it worked out first half if the goal is given is it a different thing if Mayo go in a point ahead at the break instead of a point behind suddenly those scores that Dublin rattle off at the second half aren't as much of a killer as they are even before the Dublin goal the second Dublin goal it felt Mm. you know Mayo just hadn't come out at all but I think it's probably going to be a long winter again of soul searching and trying to find a bit of a spark that can get them a little bit closer to Dublin to Kerry I know they beat Kerry six weeks ago Mm. and a season where you win away at Kerry you win away at Galway you win a national league but it still feels like some way off what it could have been and who goes is the other question like again every winter now because so many of those players have been around for so long like is that the last we're going to see of Kevin McLaughlin I'd still be surprised if Aidan O'Shea left right. I, I don't see why he would I think maybe his role will continue why to develop and off? change uh, funny I didn't think he was having that great a game he couldn't walk when he came off some people saying he had a, he definitely <laughs> had a big impact in the first half in the first 20 minutes like I was sitting right down beside the sideline and I watched him walk off like literally just a few metres away from me and like he was hobbling off he looked like he just didn't have anything left in the tank even to get himself off the pitch I, I don't know that's why I think he was taken off anyways that's fair enough I suppose then if, if I think Kelly O'Connor against Galway came on and you know offered a lot in the latter stages of that game and you probably felt he had a good 20-25 minutes in him but the game was gone mm. within minutes and it just became a bit of a mess from a Mayo point of view What do you think about McStay's comments afterwards because like I was chatting to a good few Mayo people after the game like after he'd spoken and they were kind of like frustrated at how positive he was about the season and like the sense that any season where you end it with like a 12 point loss to Dublin isn't exactly something that you should be going out being like yeah it wasn't too bad but then when you point out you know obviously leave well, away to carry away to go mm. away but then the stuff in between was so bad <laughs> it's kind of hard to judge well I think it is hard to judge because of it being the first time as well that we've had this sort of a season so the Ross Common defeat in the championship was sort of written off because Mayo had done so well in the league and maybe it put too much on that yeah I, 
it, the round robin you go and you win away at Kerry and then you absolutely blow it against Cork like and that's ultimately what means Mayo end up having to play Dublin in an All-Ireland quarter final maybe it ends uh, one way or another to Dublin or Kerry along the way but they put themselves in this position by what happened against Cork in the latter stages of that game and absolutely blowing it like Kevin McStay's personality is like that like I, it's mm-hmm. one of the reasons I think uh, people get behind him is that he he sort of he embraced the hype yeah. which I know most people outside of Mayo would say is not what you should be doing it was very much the opposite of what James Horn did who just tried to kill it at every possible <laughs> opportunity but Max Day's Max Day's personality is one of positivity and being very enough. open and honest and here's what I feel and he probably felt like the players is he talking to us is he talking to the players the players are in the dressing room they're absolutely shell shocked you could see after the game Aidan O'Shea Potter Gohor are still sitting there three four minutes after the game just shaking their heads that this is his first year in charge if this is a rookie manager coming in with his first year in charge you're probably thinking there's some signs of progress there for Mayo but because mm-hmm. it's as an experienced coaching team as you would ever have in their first year there's a definite sense of, of underachievement and maybe there's a bit of a reality check from Sunday if you look at the last three games against the Dubs so beating out the park in the second half uh, on Sunday there's 2021 uh, one of the greatest days for Mayo football the day we took down an empire is what always goes there's (laughs) there's a freakish element to that and that Dublin were totally in control in that game like they were toying with yeah, Mayo yeah. in that game for so long so there was a big gap there and Dublin mentally just broke that day mm-hmm. and Mayo found something and even then just about got over the line and you look to the previous year where it was the exact same as Sunday where Dublin Mayo are two points up at half time yeah. and Paul Mannion goes and produces one of the great Crow Park displays in the second half and is kicking points from here there and everywhere and again there's a massive gap so like the 2016-2017 Mayo side is now, by next year, it's going to be eight years ago since that great Mayo team. Almost all of them are going to be gone, probably with the exception of Paddy Durkin and maybe Aidan O'Shea. Uh, Dermot O'Connor probably still hanging around. So this is a new group trying to learn the way, still having to deal with the expectation that was with that side. And you probably look at something and think they are a bit off the top two. But again, I think, you know, you know when you're looking at Monaghan in a semi-final, Shane... Uh, I, I just can't see a scenario next year where Mayo aren't in a mix for yeah. a semi-final position again. Cause it, would we be having a similar conversation if Mayo did beat Cork that day and end up playing, say, Derry in, a, in the quarterfinal, beat Derry, and completely, then completely, and we're again we're looking at Mayo then thinking, look, look at what, the games what then that if they, they, won. they went on to a semi-final and lost by twelve points to, to Dublin or Kerry? Does it does it matter which round you lose? No, to them? no, not for Mayo people. No, like if you get to the final, you obviously, like, would you would you prefer to lose the semi-final or the final, Shane? Final, of course. Exactly. But mm. when I've been saying that, it's the fittest. <laughs> That's the mentality that gets you beaten in finals. Mm. For you to get to the final, you'd have to beat Dublin. That well, I definitely think the of yeah. there's definitely a different level of emotion that comes with it. Like, say, most of the Mayo people I met on Sunday, they started off by saying they were absolutely disgusted. They were like, go on off the ball and tell the country we are disgusted. And then by the end of the night, they were basically like, yeah, we go again, another year. Whereas before, that would have taken like two or three days of pure depression out of a lot of them to lose like that in a semi-final or a final whereas because it was that little bit before it was like they were able to come round a little bit more and maybe because of the nature of the defeat as well because it was so comprehensive yeah, Kevin McStay deserves a bit of leeway doesn't he given it's his first year in charge like and, and like it started so well with that league title like it's disappointing to go out of the championship for Mayo fans the way that they have but still a little bit of progress Dave O'Brien has been coming into the team yeah, look, they needed somebody at full back for quite a while I, listening to some of the Mayo podcasts there's definitely you know, a lot more in-depth criticism and you know, people who are watching a lot of the club game mm. are they identifying the right type of players are they uh, thinking outside the box in terms of the type of players that can uh, work us uh, at inter-county level I was you know, saw someone making the point around Michael Dara McCauley if like Michael Dara McCauley from Mayo he'd never get a look in because he's not a proper fo- you know, he's not a proper footballer <laughs> but actually at Dublin they saw something in him mm. that in midfield you need that skill set that he had the power that he had may not have been the greatest kicker of a football of all time but mm. he had what you needed at inter-county level and our Mayo looking around uh, considering the amount of footballers that there are 
are in the county for something a little bit different. Well, they have the backroom team. Like those lads, isn't McHale and all these lads' jobs to to? Isn't there a club liaison? Isn't Absolutely, there there's, no, liaison? there's all of that, and I'm sure here, if uh, when we do talk to Kevin McStay, he'll come on and say we pick what we believe are the best yeah. 26 footballers that can do a job, and there's every chance that they are picking the best 26 players in the county that can do a job. But it does feel looking at. Kerry and the genius of Clifford and just the strength in depth that Dublin are probably always going to have they need to find something a little bit different but again you get to a semi-final the draw works out in your favour you don't always need to be the best team in the country to win in All-Ireland mm. you just need to win the games on the day and that's probably Mayo's best hope for the next few days is that the next few years that you, you find yourself on the right side of the draw at some stage things work out yeah you know what we're back <laughs> you can find there's only been one national title handed out so far this year and Mayo have won it it's true yeah things happen fast so I see now they're talking about getting rid of the uh, league finals again I think I'd be doing that though people people enjoy having, having league finals I think this is the it's perfect really time of the year well not when it's, you have to go out a week later and play yeah. in the championship can you see anything but a Kerry Dublin final at this point no 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 and um, as much as I would love to see a Monaghan upset and <laughs> the, the joy that it would bring you it does feel that if Derry or Monaghan were to win mm. that that would be their day <laughs> yeah. and then actually you'd have quite a one-sided final whereas I think if, the neutral. if you get Kerry Dublin for a neutral yeah yeah, you'd want a semi similar to the semi final last year, I guess. A bit of a bit of a classic. Uh, remains to be seen. I'm still holding on to a little remnants. No, no, here, listen. I think in our last four, four weeks, someone correct me, but I think the last four times Monaghan and Dublin have played each other in the last couple of years, Monaghan have won three of them. Oof. You think? You think? <laughs> someone you got your stats. <laughs> someone correct me. The other one could have been a draw as well. Someone correct me on that. If and, I'm wrong. And, and just let us know this now: has, has Vinnie Curry been directly in touch as to what the game plan is for the next? Are you, are you playing things down, or are you? Ah, you have to. You have to do a Ross Common, don't you? Like you have to keep the ball for as long as you can. Absolutely. Like what's, what's give the them point? nothing. Frustrate the well, life out of them. This is the thing. Have the hill booing. 100%. Yeah, yeah. Like you're not there for their entertainment. I want to see Monaghan run out and warm up in front of the hill as you well. You want Brawley writing 3,000 words how Monaghan are a disgraced yeah. football on the Sunday morning. Can forget about That's your best as chance of winning. As far as their county, yeah. <laughs> Let them at it. Yeah, 100%. We'll, we'll like, I, I have, so on the Instagram stories last week for the Monaghan game, like everyone in Monaghan seemed to be at the Armagh game. The, the, like everyone, I literally mean everyone in Monaghan is going to this Dublin game like I don't know what the allocation for Monaghan will be 30,000 that'll be half the county and uh, there are people coming from abroad as well uh, in the brothers flying in if they beat Dublin for the final This Mo- the biggest Monaghan game in your lifetime probably but the, I suppose they had a semi-final against Tyrone in 2018 where they were like, kick of the ball they lost by a point they probably should why have won why does this feel game. bigger I guess it's Dublin penalties in a quarter final as well just adds a bit of drama maybe around the whole thing McManus clutch McManus there's a few talking points, um, so maybe it's just more like it's this team. Like Vinny, Vinny Corey said, they had a team meeting at the start of the year, and getting to a final was the was the ambition. So one game away, who knows? Oh, that's, I'm not, see, I, I, is it like Mayo or back always talk about? It's not so much about the football and the games; it's the days out that you get and all yeah. the fun around it and the weeks of build up and expectation and just the heart crushing to What's wrong with that? Exactly. No, that's what I'm saying. That? But that, that's the best part of it I all. I never get the criticism. The actual like 70 <sighs> minutes on the pitch is probably the most pain part, painful part of the whole thing. It's yeah. all the bits. Of, it's like Christmas. Christmas Day is not actually the best part. It's like build up. all the fun around it. That, my big disappointment was I had pulled a Sheehan on this and I was like, no, we go camping that weekend because whatever happens, the weekend, the <laughs> semi-final, final, I am keeping free. Yeah, 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 because, yeah. And one of the big disappointments on a weekend when Mayo loses you're like ah oh, but when they're playing at Crow Park all the lads come up people you haven't seen since last year everybody's up for the weekend mm. it's a good night out on Saturday night there's a bit of crack around town on the Sunday <laughs> like, that's the bit you want yeah the crack but again that's the loser mentality Shane don't you be enjoying yourself in the build up you better not be having any nights now on the Thursday night with all the legends or something no, that you're no. emceeing and getting a handy few quid for <laughs> that sort no of stuff fun. is losing the run of yourself God forbid you have a bit of fun before the game you know I tell you there'll be a lot of money to be made for you now if Monaghan win this semi-final would be hopefully you never know I'm available on LinkedIn there lads if you want me <laughs> Twitter at Shane Hannon 01 cash only <laughs> cash only yeah. brown envelopes please um, yeah no it's one of those things I tweeted the other day a photo of uh, one of the, the articles after the, the weekend's football saying Dublin 
Kerry final on the cards. And I was like, ah, oh, stick in the dressing room, lads. Monan and Derry. Conan Darty replied, a, a journalist from Derry, of course, and he he said, yeah, sure, listen, wouldn't, wouldn't, be, wouldn't it be great to kick a few points in Croke Park in a semi final even? Wouldn't it be great for Monan just to go out and score a goal against Dub- the great Dublin team, wouldn't it? Red carpet. It's an honour for, for Conor McManus to even get to play in Croke Park. To get to play it? there, 100%. I mean, Jesus, for this Monan team who've spent 10 years in Division 1, wouldn't it just be an honour to line out against the Dubs? But look, I'll, I'll have convinced myself before that. Saturday week that we, we can beat the Dubs Is McManus the most important individual player to any county over the last decade even? Probably Like Clifford is maybe getting there for Kerry which is remarkable when you think of Kerry and the general like strength Halber. that they yeah. have Yeah Although having said that like you know, Gary Mark, Brennan down in Clare Possibly But the future would uh, beyond McManus now looks a little bit brighter because they're like they, they've played a lot of games this year without him and they've won games without him. But obviously for clutch moments like Croke Park at the weekend, I mean. like 2010, like Marty Clark or Benny Coulter for down, possibly yeah, getting them to that All Ireland final, dragging a team to a final. Yeah, it can happen. And if McManus does it this year, I mean, well, if it if it happens this year, there, there's other players, Conor McCarthy and Carlo Connell who've dragged Monaghan there as well. But yeah, it remains to be seen. We'll uh, we'll hold on to the hope anyway. But Nathan, you haven't killed our hope entirely just yet. I know you're saying it's Dublin Kerry oh, final. Hope, but hope, but that's all you've got, Shane. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'll enjoy the build up and yeah LinkedIn and, and Twitter is where you get me for all the for all the gigs um, I was chatting to Gavin Bazunu yesterday down at the Shamrock Rovers Academy at Roadstone you're taller than Gavin Bazunu I am I was looking it up because I was looking it up in advance I was yeah like, I wasn't sure if that was just a camera angle or if no, you actually were I, I deciphered I'm, so I'm 6'4 and Gavin 6'2 so I mean obviously I'm not an international goalkeeper but <laughs> clearly <laughs> he's got that ahead of me uh, Stephen Kenny's looking though <laughs> he's looking you know uh, he's an impressive lad for, for 21 years of age you know has a, a strong head in his shoulders like he talks a lot about reading Malcolm Gladwell's psychology books and was someone who was very keen you know even when he was heading over to Manchester City he wanted to complete his education do his leave insert which he did uh, he's got a younger brother now who's also a goalkeeper in the Shamrock mm. Rovers Academy um, but it was they were launching this boot room initiative which is a really good idea I think a couple of other clubs in the League of Ireland are doing it obviously football boots are expensive you probably know as the father of kids Nathan that football boots if a kid sees Erling Haaland or Kylian Mbappe wearing a certain set of boots they are the boots you have to buy and they're maybe 100 120 quid sometimes maybe more but like this, this is something that the Shamrock Rovers Academy have started so that the people can donate boots and uh, Gavin Bazunu has donated 5,000 euro worth of boots so that's oh. kind of where he uh, was, was over chatting to, to press about it uh, Michelle McPhail it was her idea Steve McPhail's wife and obviously they have kids as well involved in the academy um, but yeah he spoke very well like even he, he watches all the Shamrock Rovers games still if not in person on, on, on the telly or stream or whatever over in England um, hasn't yet met Russell Martin the new Southampton manager has spoken to him um, but certainly the vibe I was getting from Gavin yesterday is that he's, he's, he's going to be at Southampton next season for that championship push and they very much think that they can come straight back up to the Premier League yeah, That's interesting because uh, obviously a lot of the headlines in the papers from the interviews today is that he still sees himself as a Premier League player Yeah. Now I was wondering was that a <laughs> come and get me plea that I want to be back and I feel I should be back in the Premier League uh, it does feel as though a year at Southampton in the Championship and Southampton even though they're going to lose it seems three or four of their important players yeah. might still have enough quality to be near the top half and just to rebuild a little bit of confidence because as mentally strong as he may be like that was a tough tough year there was a lot of televised games yeah. that he struggled in and you know as much as we looked at his season with green tinted glasses and got very frustrated with Jamie Carragher's criticism there was some uh, validity in what he had to say about Bazunu. he looked very unsure at times you think back to that Arsenal game where Arsenal came from behind um, at, like even the last goal where he just sort of palms it back but he shouldn't be playing Premier League football at 21 years of age as a yeah. goalkeeper in many ways like it just doesn't happen and it's no surprise if you look at the other young goalkeeper in the Premier League Ilan Melier at Leeds who's you know, similar in ways to Bazunu and that he's such a modern goalkeeper mm. so good with the ball at his feet like Melier made a huge amount of mistakes over the last couple of years as yeah. well but doesn't seem to have lost any of his value or mm. the demand to sign him because again goalkeepers he's 21 he could be playing Premier League football in 14 years yeah, 15 years mm. easily so you just hope that actually when you go and talk to Gavin Bazuna in five years time yeah. he's talking about that season with Southampton and actually that was the most important season of his career uh, a little bit out of the spotlight next season in the championship because again we, it's, it, I guess it's impossible to get your head around you know playing in a game of that magnitude against Arsenal on that Friday night wasn't it a Friday night game yeah could have been Friday night game and it was Arsenal going for the title and the pressure that is on you as you're trying to hold out the title chasing side 
and it wasn't even the mistake that night it was the uncertainty where it came out of the box a couple of times it was miscommunication with the defenders but you're at a team down the bottom of the table like every team down the bottom of the table these mistakes happen with so like what you're saying there about you know probably acknowledging the criticism but mm. being able to block it out yeah and it's when we've seen him for Ireland he's been generally exceptional yeah he certainly seems well capable of dealing with it the criticism because he started though he started the first 32 games of the season and and then that game happens the three hall with Arsenal that you mentioned on, on the 21st of April and Alex McCarthy comes in and just takes his spot but that's a learning curve for a 21 year old goalkeeper like and it's not like Alex McCarthy would come in and and, and shot the lights out you know um, so Gavin will be definitely within, in with the shout of being the number one from the start of next season like he sp- spoke even yesterday about the, the impact being at Man City had on him the the uh, Shavi, the goalkeeping coach at Man City the impact he's had in his career um, and full of praise for, for, for Everton at Shamrock Rovers as well like his development when you think back to him being 16 you know saving that penalty I was it against Cork and like mm. just being thrust into senior League of Ireland football he was clearly capable of it and, and, and probably more physically developed at 16 than, than some other goalkeepers in the league um, but he just has that side to his game he's improved his distribution his shot stopping I don't think has ever been in question um, but he's dealt with like even that Cristiano Ronaldo penalty like that just thrust I know we didn't win the game in the end but mm. like that sort of thing thrusts you into the limelight yeah and he, look, there's a highlights reel there over the season as well of brilliant saves he made and when Alex McCarthy came in Alex McCarthy played six games and conceded 17 goals <laughs> things didn't get any better no. like, that is what happens and it may well have been a case of just taking them uh, and try. And, and at that stage uh, managers in the relegation zone will just try anything mm. basically and a change in goalkeeper I don't think anyone felt it was going to be a, a change in form and like, he's probably in a similar situation to Nathan Collins in that Collins who's just gone through mm. and signed for Brentford which probably is something of a surprise uh, considering he just went to Wolves last year and yeah. he's just broken his own Irish transfer record you do look at both of them and think they're so well suited to playing at a top team mm. at a top 6 team top 8 team with their style of football with how comfortable they are in possession of the football they just need to get a couple of good solid seasons under their belt to make that next step and this is a big move for Nathan Collins as well because Wolves it didn't work out and yeah. it was a struggle at the start of the season Lopetegui comes in obviously feels with Craig Dawson that maybe it was just for experience and it was something in Collins that he wasn't quite sure about and all you hear from Wolves about Lopetegui uh, they rave about him yeah. uh, so he's clearly a, you know, a brilliant coach and brilliant manager but Collins face it in face the worry when you go to a club like Brentford is that Thomas Frank is a very in-demand manager <laughs> that you find yourself in a situation again six months down the line where they're changing manager you're scrapping for your position whereas you feel actually if there's solidity there if Brentford can back it up finish top 10 again next season and he's a key part of that mm. in a heart of a good Brentford defence that then maybe you get that move next year or the year after because maybe and it might sound ridiculous having to defend old school defending like you have to do with a team down the bottom of the table may not suit Nathan Collins' skill set needs to be on the ball yeah and, and the suggestion seems to be in a lot of the papers that uh, there's an idea that wol- Wolves might be heading heading south you know financially certainly mm. and, and then you'd, you'd, I'm not going to curse them but uh, like, rumours that they could end up being Leeds or an Ipswich where you could well, if it's you get really bizarre what's going on in that uh, uh, Max Kilman who was playing alongside Craig Dawson in the Hearts defence uh, the talk of him going to Napoli for I think they turned down the bid for 30 million uh, expectation Napoli would go back maybe with 40 million but like Collins and Kilman at the start of last season they were talking about a Wolves could be a centre-back partnership for the next three or four years two of the best young defenders in the English game uh, there was speculation about Lopetegui's future at the end of last season again that they just didn't have the finances so Wolves it's incredible how quickly it turns like Wolves a couple of years ago we're looking at under Nuno Matt Doherty out on the right hand side mm. Neves and Moutinho Raul Jimenez flying up front we're like this is the example but then when you go down the route that they went down which has basically been George Mendes baby yeah and players are just passing through and Mendes is obviously uh, looking elsewhere now it turns out Saudi Arabia is somewhat more attractive than uh, Wolverhampton to do your business in uh, they find themselves in a in a little spot of bother yeah well I've been to Wolverhampton and I'm been sure to. you have to it's Pretty, pretty I didn't big. hang around. The, I'm sorry, the best thing about Wolverhampton is you can get the train straight in. Yeah, fair enough. Birmingham Airport. And I, I didn't hang around. It could be a beautiful part of... Uh 
Yeah. Well, I Black stayed country, the night the and ended up Wolves. getting an earlier train than I had initially attended to. Finished up the game at one o'clock. Was supposed to get in the morning. Was supposed to get the train at I think it was like eleven and ended up getting the seven train, which is like the first train back to London in Wolverhampton. In from Wolverhampton. Wolverhampton. Well, when I went there, I went there for England's last warm-up game before the Euros last summer, and uh, the only restaurant that was open, and like this was early enough in the day that didn't have very drunk football fans that obviously were not there for the women's game outside of them was a McDonald's so that kind of mm. said a lot at the time yeah I think uh, my, my picture of of, my, of um, Wolverhampton was coloured it was uh, staying in a, a mo- in a not a motel yeah pretty much motel in, in the shadow of Bolognese Stadium and like it was a pretty grim place like stains in the carpet sort of place you know yeah I, I like I could name many uh, English towns of covering games that I've like mm. could uh, talk down but then I feel that maybe like your experience is the problem that mm. we go to these football matches like I stayed in the cheapest possible hotel <laughs> I could stay in I stayed out all night I got straight off the train went to the pub it just doesn't feel like a very it doesn't feel like a very warm place <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 it's fair like, oh. is, wait, is Wolverhampton in the black country? it is yeah, the black is. country yeah. we, we, the we black country it. sounds like it must be a nice place there must be something attractive about it but it, like is it forest? Well, is it not the black country because of the mines? Could be, and like the, oh. and because of the absolute financial devastation that it went to through whenever they started closing down. This this is an education. Yeah, I love it. I mean, the the surrounding area is beautiful. Like the train there is very gorgeous. All the countryside and stuff. But uh, yeah, no, there's just there was an edge to a town. You know, when you go to a town and there's an edge to it. That's what I felt. And maybe it was there, me being there Got by the myself answer for as you. well. The area was one of the industrial revolution's birthplaces. Either the thirty foot thick coal seam close to the surface, or the mix of coal works, coke works iron works glass works brick works and steel works which obviously had soot and air pollution led to the area's name which was first recorded in the 1840s wow it was me looking for the forest don't tell you we <laughs> don't teach us things see we had the car over on the ferry so we drove out of Wolverhampton and it was as grim the whole entire way out of it so there is that now we, I was at the snooker as well as uh, the staying near Molyneux so the Aldersley Leisure Centre so the, so the snooker was on that's pretty uh, that, that's exactly exactly as it sounds Watching Snooker and Aldersley Leisure Centre. So uh, it's not exactly the Crucible. Let me it's not just exactly Monaghan, is it? It's not exactly Monaghan. No, no, it wouldn't be. <laughs> uh, we should, I mentioned the, the Gavin Mazzuno interview. With that full interview you'll be able to watch, of course, on, on YouTube uh, this morning, uh, around 10 minutes or so in total. He was, he was interested in a number of different things. So bringing a clip, he was talking about um, Stephen Kenny and I guess criticism of Stephen Kenny and this idea that Stephen Kenny needs either two points or four points from these French and Dutch games coming up in September. Uh, so I asked Gavin his thoughts uh, from a player's perspective on the criticism levelled at Stephen Kenny. Uh, the international games, of course, uh, a bit of a mixed bag in the last couple of, couple of uh, windows. But I guess in September, the French and Dutch games. I mean, you hear the media reports that he needs he needs four points, Stephen Kenny, to keep his job. He needs two points to keep his job. But 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 I guess within the camp, you guys aren't listening to any of that. So what's the what's the reflection on, on, on Stephen Kenny, Kenny's tenure so far? I heard you saying to, to one of the, the journalists before, you know, this word promising. You know, you're a young squad that have been so promising. But uh, again, you want to get rid of that word now and just start, I guess, delivering results. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. For me, Stephen has been incredible to be able to bring through the amount of players he's brought through. And, you know, at the start, everyone was talking about promising. And I think it's now time for us as players to, to step up and prove that we're not just promising anymore. We are the, you know, not the finished article, but we're getting close towards it. And we're all players that are willing and ready to take the responsibility uh, to be able to go out there and get results. Yeah, I like what Gavin Mazzuni is saying there, talking about the, this idea that this Irish young the young players in the squad were promising and he says now we have to start delivering that promise and get results like clearly something that you want to hear players saying um because there's all this talk about these young players that have come through Stephen Kenny under 21 level but now they have to at senior level start delivering they're of an age now 21 22 where results are imperative yeah club and country they need to start yeah. delivering so Gavin Bazoon is one of those who's played all the time but Stephen Kenny's put a lot of trust and faith in those under 21s and uh, they haven't been able to repay him at club level either no. so you know he starts Adamita over in Greece like Adamita is getting game time in Norwich but he's not scoring goals mm. and he's a huge fan of Adamita and maybe he just needed to delay his introduction back into the international side and have him as an impact player but a lot of these guys just haven't kicked on at club level again they're very young so there's no reason why they won't mm. over the next few years but like it was a difficult situation in Greece where a lot of those young players hadn't played in a long time so he's right and they have to step up otherwise Stephen Kenny won't be in a job yeah. come the end of the year exactly Yeah, time to get results James Lee uh, keep the comments by the way coming in on YouTube James Lee says uh, when Mayo did beat Dublin in that semi-final they celebrated on the pitch like they had won the final 
I don't like this idea of people being fun police if Monaghan beat Dublin Saturday week there are going to be massive celebrations on the pitch as well well Dublin hadn't lost a championship game yeah. was it since 2014 <laughs> so there was a sense of this was an end of an era and also you know, I think if Mayo had won that game by six points and Dublin hadn't turned up, there would have been a mm. small celebration. It was the fact that they were dead and buried and had somehow come back. back. Yeah, like nobody, nobody in that stadium thought Mayo were going to win that game. <laughs> Ten minutes into the second half, yeah, just come out of nowhere. Uh, Shane says Nathan was smirking after they knocked Galway out. Time to retreat back to your box. Yeah. I, I was getting lots of abuse on Sunday uh, oh, yeah. from all the Galway fans for the abuse I was giving them the week before, which is fine. Mm. I, 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 it's, it's, it's okay That's to it's all about. enjoy beating your nearest neighbours. It's fine. It's all right. <laughs> I don't mind. Like, and I, I, I don't get upset if Dublin fans are trying to ram it down Mayo's throat this week. Like, I, you won. Yeah, I, I have to enjoy say, it. I, was, I, was, I stayed in Ballina last weekend and uh, went to this, the, to watch the match. We went to the beach bar. My local. Uh, which is your local locker's head. Your local. Yeah. Which is Sligo. Lovely, lovely, lovely area. A scenic area. Went for a walk on the beach after the match. Yeah. But I have to say that I was thinking, oh, we're only a couple of miles from the border here with Mayo. This is going to be very border. Ma- Mayo. The border. The border. <laughs> Mayo centric. A lot of Mayo fans are going to be here. Walked in. There's a couple of Sligo jerseys doing the rounds. Pub was packed. And I mean to a man and woman. Everyone wanted the dubs to win. Beach Bar, though, would be like St. Farnham sort of territory, and they would have quite a lot of rivalry with some of the Mayo clubs on the border. So it would definitely be one. I think if you went a little bit more central into Sligo, you would have got far more people right. supporting Sligo than you would there. Like, I got the train up on Sunday to go to the game, and like the Clooney station normally has about three people on the platform, and there was near 50. And I was like, well, didn't know this many Mayo people existed in Sligo. There you go. Um, so it's, it's the summer, so all the dubs are. Down the country, possibly that's it oh, too. The dubs. Yeah, yeah. Had you your top on during this? I was very disturbed on Instagram. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you get to go away <laughs> in your holidays, but like, leave, leave the top on when you're well, posting you on the Instagram. You can't wear a top when you're at a jacuzzi, you know. Uh, they don't post it, Shane. It's just, ah, listen, <laughs> it's a bit much. Nathan, when you're in your prime, you got to post these well, things. Exactly, but some, the day will come where I can't post. Top I think day, I, I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, Shane, but I think the day may have come. Well, it, may, it may have come. Yeah, barreling down towards thirty now, but. Um, not quite at your level just yet, Nathan. Uh, someone says, Connor Rose says, that part of England is where hope goes to die. So, um, some sort of black country, I think, for, for some people. But, but there, I'm sure there are lovely areas in the black country, and no offence intended to anyone. Can't wait to our first live commentary of the Premier League season, live from Molyneux. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Put down. Yeah, exactly. Uh, look after yourself over there, Nathan. 8 uh, 01 a.m. on this Tuesday. <sighs> done it again. Tuesday. Wednesday. Wednesday. Happy Wednesday, folks. It's hump day, and I, I know all about it. Uh, OTBM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball. We'll have uh, Tommy Welch in studio, live with us, just after the break. Can't wait for that. Uh, but first, we'll bring you a clip from the latest episode of the Football Pod. Have a look. OTB AM. It's Galway versus Kilkenny. But not as you know it. It's the fastest I've ever seen you on in your life, brother. <laughs> just... Curling Pod Live is off to the Port Gosh Energy Theatre in Dublin this July. And you're invited. I'll be joined by my co-host James Scale and Paul Murphy on the night. Start the leveller, he'd say, and the tractor is coming after us. <laughs> as we debate the highs and lows of the 2023 season and preview the All-Ireland Hurling Final. Plus, we'll be announcing some more hurling legends to take the stage with us. <laughs> it was a rook, I got confused. <laughs> it's happening on July 20th at the Board Gosh Energy Theatre. It's an exclusive off-air event. Tickets are limited, so don't delay. Go to offtheball.com forward slash events for more. Board Gosh Energy, proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Senior Hurling. Championship. This is what intercounty hurling is, is it? That's why I should have said the rugby. Jimmy had a bit of a howler. Jimmy went big on Mayo. <laughs> uh, I, magic. I must say, I got that badly wrong. Yes. I didn't actually realise that Dublin were going to be that good. I think mean, that was my main mistake. You know what? Like, you're mad. I Dublin were better than I thought they were going to be. A good bit better. Now, at the same time, their full back line was under savage pressure in the first half. <laughs> I mean, they were in trouble. They can you, see keep eight points after this full, you keep going after this full back line. Sure, they, they changed the merchant had to go on to, to Tommy Conroy. They put someone else back. They definitely changed their system at half time as well. Another clean to protect sheet, them. Though. Yeah, but they tidy right up second half. But that's a sign of a great team that you can actually just change and adapt, especially at half time, just get in and change it up. But no, I was very impressed with Dublin. Our Mayo, very disappointed, but. Is it, is know, it fair to say. Architects of their own downfall again. Two goals were diabolical as well. 
is it fair to say yeah. that yeah. regardless of Kerry's statement that they made on Saturday and that was impressive and we'll come back to that very impressive yeah. what we saw from Dublin given what Mayo showed us in the first half was even more impressive mm-hmm. we, were just, we were just chatting was that off fair Jimmy before we came on I, I actually thought Kerry were the most impressive team of the weekend genuinely OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball 8.04am on this Wednesday morning's OTBM the Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball with myself and Nathan live with you until 10 o'clock delighted to say a treat for us all now Tommy Welch is live in studio morning Tommy how are things? Good morning Shane putting us to shame with the suit as well Jesus I mean what a man if we'd known if we'd known myself and Nathan could have at least put an effort in we, you never do Nathan I know but it's still on call for again isn't this? there's a lot of, <laughs> lot of cheap shots here off. see I was getting an awful lot of abuse from, from Nathan on the crappy quiz on Friday so just taking my opportunity I won it so that you know revenge he did he, he won it uh, how are you keeping Tommy? yeah great it's great to listen Coming up to probably the biggest weekend in hurling, bar the All Ireland final, like the semi final, since the, I suppose the provincials have turned into a round robin, have been probably epic, you know, and um, really looking forward to this weekend. I'd say our first one was probably 2018, mm. Limerick's first. Um, Cork semi final. You know, the, the Cork semi final, when they're down by six or seven points, only a couple of minutes to go, and how those probably eight minutes oh. changed the history of, of hurling, like, you know, and. So that's what we're heading into. Hopefully another great weekend in Hurling. How have you found the championship so far, generally speaking? I thought, to be honest, Shane, it's an outstanding championship. And, you know, I suppose it was all kind of the Munster Championship versus the Leinster Championship, mm-hmm. really, for, for so long. But if you take each of them in their own right, the Munster Championship never lets you down. Like, you know, um, you go back down to the to the game between Cork and Tipperary, Tipperary, Clare, you could pick any of them. I was lucky enough um, that I was at the one, the Limerick and Clare one down in the Gaelic Rounds. Mm-hmm. And, like, that was old school Championship hurling. It was just, it had the feel of, if you lose, you're gone. And even though you weren't gone out of the Championship, it was a derby and yeah. um, it just felt every much like that and we were treated then to normally them games they're intense you know they're, there's not much going on only hard hitting and that but it was extraordinary hurling in it as well like so you had the best of both worlds and you had Lone up and down the sideline like you know like Loch Nan with his white runners those many <laughs> years ago just commanding like you know and the whole crowd and, like got some feeling that night of the love and appreciation and honour and respect the clear supporters and players had for Law on that day and the whole place was in it together and listen they won that day Limerick got back to revenge in the Munster final and um, on they go now to the semi-final as champions again and won the, the Munster for the for the five in a row the only team outside of Cork in my knowledge to do it mm. which is extraordinary for that group of players you know and mainly the same group of players that's doing it they're not bringing through you know new guys every year or anything like you know it's nearly 12 roughly around 12 and that in a couple then uh, in and out then uh, every year depending on, on who's injured or who's in form um, and then like you know the Leinster Championship is you know not received there. the same. It, it's <laughs> there. Oh, the it's, final. The final was good. The final was good, right? Mm. But if you do go back and look at um, like the big argument a couple of weeks ago on the Sunday game was, what are we doing to promote hurling? And it's grand. We have the glory days, but like Antrim and Westmead in in the Leinster Championship. Mm. Like you talk to anyone in in, in the hurling hotbeds, blowing Clonkill or Aharney or up in Antrim in the Glens, like that are obsessed and love hurling every bit as much as anyone in Kilkenny or Cork or Tipperary or Limerick. They deserve their day in the sun. And listen, if it leads to a few matches that are a bit lopsided, that but if they're happy, that's promoting hurling up there. We want that to happen and we seen the day Westmead went on and beat Wexford like nobody you couldn't predict that mm-hmm. and um, go back to the to, to the underage setups with Westmead it didn't come out of nowhere Westmead Beckley Kenny an under 21 championship not so long ago when Eddie was over them and um, nobody saw that coming so it didn't come from, from nowhere so 16 point turnaround that was brilliant the, the, the day down in, in Wexford Park as well when Wexford had to win yeah. to cut, you know to ensure that they were in the Lee McCarthy Cup next year like that was an extraordinary day now I wasn't at a christening to go to that day myself I missed it but you know mother and father down there a lot of people I know were down there asking about like the atmosphere like the sang bull of oak before it just to you know bring in the, the atmosphere and the tradition and the history of Wexford Hurling and 
you know, I thought I'd do a bit of work down with for like met that meant an awful lot to them and mm. listen to the radio interviews Tom Dempsey and these guys on the radios like you know, very emotional and so on both sides, uh Linser and Munster, they both offer different things, uh Shane and go on into the to to to, to the last one, Tony Kelly like <laughs> not hurling Millen scores three four. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, Who's your favourite hurler to watch? To watch now. Uh, I love Hegarty. <laughs> I would say the Kilkenny, like, you know, for Kilkenny, I love Mullen. Adrian Mullen, I suppose, I've been watching all the Mullen since the, the, the young chaps, like, but uh, Adrian, you know, he's that whole Ballyhale craft and toughness and fitness, but the skill and just a, a joy to watch as well, and sure. But Hegarty from, 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 from Limerick is, is, is somebody, like, you know, and especially with the criticism mm. and the, the scrutiny that's... <laughs> because I just know from playing the game, like, you go in to get the ball, like, sometimes, you know, the hurl get, you know... Mm. It's, go on, what? <laughs> Things but, can happen, yeah. Well, I'm saying you go for the ball, like, it's just, like there's so many variables, like, when you're going for this. It's not like soccer where there's the one ball in your foot, like, you can't slide tackle, obviously, in soccer anymore. Like, mm. You know, it's a red car, but mm. hurling's there gone to the point where if you you go for a tackle and you miss it you know um, remember um, Cork there a couple of years it was that game no it was against Waterford I'd say the year in 2000 maybe 17 when um, Damien Kelhan went for, for, for a tackle and just was sidestepped and next minute I got I think he got a second yellow and mm -hmm. I just felt that's not the, you know that's not the way because like, just when you're watching hurling, you, it looks terrible on television and that. But when you're in the game, you go full blooded for, for the ball, and sometimes you know you miss the ball. Yeah. And that shouldn't mean you scrutiny with you know slow down cameras and because it can look terrible, like you make that look terrible. But listen, Hegarty, anyways, will be one guy. Um, Galan at the moment, though, mm. is the best hurler in the country. I think um, he's just unmarkable at the moment. So if any of us beat, beat Limerick, I think we'll have to mark Galan. A uh, couple of things on that, just on Hegarty. So there's been quite a few incidents over the last couple of years, quite a few red cards. Like the one that happened this year, and the f just the ferocity of the show, the way he went into that tackle. As much as you want that physicality, does he, with that scrutiny that he's under, does he not need to change his approach to the game? Is he not putting his team potentially at risk when managers are clearly watching them, or referees are clearly watching them? Yeah, well, a lot about the the, the tackles that's been put in Hegarty for the ball. Mm. I would say, like you know, like you see, it's it's tough and forwards these days, Nathan. Um, like like you know, like say you take twenty years ago, you were you were told. Forget about the referee. You look after yourself. So corner back, wing back, they're always up. Maybe shoving you in the back, pulling your jersey. You know, maybe off the ball stuff that nobody can see. And um, like it, the referee, umpires don't really get involved. Like you know, it's mainly down to to, to the referee, and he can't see everything. He only has he only has two eyes. So like, what does a forward do? Like you know, um, you can't you know hit hit a fella dig back anymore because she get a red card yeah. you know yeah. so like all the if you're in, you know and you never see a, a back in a red card for shoving a ladder pulling his jersey or digging him so like you know Hegarty went you know he was a little bit late and that jostled down and it was on the sideline it just happened to be in front of the the bench which made it look a lot worse but um, you know there's probably has to be a bit of protection for the forwards as well that are suffering these off the ball you know like off the ball challenges if you like but and you that's why I, I, I find you see there's a lot more diving nowadays do you ever see you know when a fella gets yeah. a bit he's down holding his, but he's probably he, he has no other choice really because he can't hit the lad back like you know the, you can't do that Yeah. so you're a red card so I, I just have a lot of sympathy for forwards uh, nowadays I was probably the back doing that <laughs> forwards for years but have you seen the diving? they were able to give it back to me so it was all water has the diving creeped in slowly or or was that something that, that existed when you were a player but just maybe oh, less, never, less so never existed Shane but like never existed back then like but there was no red cards really back then unless you did something you know that was Greek deserving of, yeah <laughs> deserving of a red card like you know so so you, you, you your sense is that the diving has crept in because forwards have to try and get it's the only way they can get the defenders punished yeah I don't think there's any protection for them like um, you know and you know you can't have six referees like a, an American football game either mm. listen you're just looking at a free taking competition so mm. listen that's just their way the game will evolve to again and, and on they'll go but um, no listen I'd, I'd have no like, I don't think there's any issues in the game at the moment like there's always talks about rule changes and we'll change this we'll change that Hurling is epic at the moment like 
you know why would you change anything you hear people saying there's too many scores but that's kind of an argument that has I guess been around the, the, the weight of the slitter and stuff as well yeah well scores are probably doubled probably in the last probably 15-20 years but I think that's more to do with the ping in the ball like like people say the game the ball hasn't changed the, the ball has changed like if you play the game the ball has changed like the ping yeah the weight might be the same if you, you hit a ball now you can glide the ball over on the run from 60-70 yards like you know beforehand you'd have to give it your almighty 100% Johnny McMahon effort mm. to score the ball from 80 yards like, lads, you know so the ping and the ball has changed like uh, as in I think Patrick Horgan actually said he was on with us recently and, he, and, and he, Horgan said like the ball has improved in the last year or two because he, he remembers a couple of years ago even hitting freeze and he wasn't exactly sure wh- you know he was hitting it the usual way but he wasn't exactly sure where it was going to go trajectory wise but now you know it's pure and you can actually from 60 70 meters you can exactly tell where it's going to go so players have clearly got to, got to grips with the new slitter it's it, it, it's one of the things that i guess was was an issue in the last couple of years well yeah and you see when you got the ball in the half back line full back line you gave it an almighty effort it went in as far as the full back you know the, mm. the, the, the full forward line we'll say and then the action off it went again there a good full forward versus a good full back and so on and so forth so that's why you're seeing a lot more when they give it the almighty effort now it's gone wider over the bar You were say, we were saying before we started the, the build up to the semi-finals feels maybe a little quieter than it, than it usually does like it's Wednesday Galway Limerick on Saturday you've Clare Kilkenny on Sunday it doesn't feel like All-Ireland semi-final week maybe it's because there were four All-Ireland quarterfinals in the football last weekend that we're still digesting and also that as you were saying Nathan there hasn't been much in the line of media there's not even looking at the papers today and uh, maybe I've missed a couple but like Pat Horgan has been in- interviewed in all the papers talking about TJ Reid <laughs> so they're trying to get players from the counties that have been knocked out to talk about the four counties that are still in it mm. to make a story from what I'm aware I don't think any of the four counties uh, did any media at all ahead of this and again I'm sure everyone watching is going tough lads it's not about ye but just for people trying to get excited about this to get to know a little bit more about the players I know Kilkenny you saw uh, and still do a great final press night and they get everyone down to Langton's and uh, you get the bit of steak and all that down there and uh, <laughs> Cody would have the chat and you'd get five or six players as well but uh, it does feel as though and it's not just hurling hurling and football they're not helping themselves with the lack of access to players at the moment yeah definitely I suppose they're afraid of so much going on in the, the, the media and social media is now they're probably trying to protect their players and that they feel that's their duty like um you look at say John Kiley like this weekend there is so much to promote like John Kiley I see he's been in 12 finals 12 national finals hasn't lost one mm. he's trying to get to the all Ireland final again to make it 13 out of 13 Henry Shefflin over Galway like Shefflin has won what, 10 all Irelands as a player he's won three or four club all earns as a player he's won two club all earned finals as a manager he's be like I wonder is he trying to become the first manager to win as a player and as a manager uh, an all earned club and an all earned senior inter county mm. like, that's incredible stuff to just do. so he'll have it over Cody <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah sure Cody probably has it all except for an all earned in the club as a manager so that'll tell you how, <laughs> how it is. That photo um, of, of Cody, like, the, was it the Leinster final when Kenny got the last minute goal? He's in the crowd giving an absolute load. Oh, smile. brilliant. I don't think I'd ever seen Brian Cody smile that much. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, that was an amazing day, for, you know, for because it was so dramatic. Yeah. Like, you were up eight points in the Leinster final. Cody would bring it down. They had the ball in the safest place of all time, was in the corner underneath the, the Davin stand. And you couldn't see a goal coming from it and Killian Buckley then who was defender for most of his career gets the chance and slots it lovely into the corner and like I said to the lads I was working on that game as well I say thank God it wasn't live because <laughs> <laughs> you know it would have been like local radio and um, you could see that I think emotion in all the Kilkenny people that day and the supporters but ah yeah Cody was always a great man to celebrate a win like you know he he never shied away from you look at him after any of his All-Ireland victories yeah before that he kept it calm enough because the ultimate goal was to win the All-Ireland but when he won All-Irelands he was a great man to to show his emotions and um, absolutely unreal and you know sure listen that's what we're looking into to, to, to Saturday Galway and Limerick um, could be historic can you see it going any any way other than a than a Limerick victory? I guess the the question is you mentioned Galan, like he, Galway can't really allow Galan to score one four inside and expect to go on and win the game. Is Dahi Burke the man you put on Galan, or how do you how do you marshal yeah. it? 
I'd probably leave Garraud in on it. Like right. I wouldn't change around the team at this stage. Garraud, I know he was taken off the last day, but sometimes if you had a poor game the first day, so his the All-Ireland quarter final, you're revved up. There's no needs to talk to you at all in the next two weeks because you'll have your own self in hall already. And I'd say Garraud, McInerney, knowing him, and knowing the way he's been playing over the last couple of years, he will be absolutely... Now, he'll need plenty of support from his um, from uh, from his defenders, uh, Dahi Burks and, and uh, Parag Mannion with him, and Joseph Cooney, because... You never defend on your own. Like JJ Laney used to always say that with us, like, you don't ever defend on your own. You're always defending with someone. And that's the sign of the great defences that they defend together. So if McInerney is in there, when that ball breaks, he'll need his cornerbacks, he'll need his wingbacks hoovering in around him. But uh, it, is, it is an incredible task, what he, what he has to take on. He has to take on um, Galan. I'd leave out Dahi Cinder back, you know, try and shore up the, the middle. But listen, Galwick, can they beat, can they beat Limerick? Like, they're the one team to have always beaten favourites in semi-finals mm-hmm. like you go back to 0-1 when Kilkenny were the all-conquering team 2000 and they won the Leinster final again in 2000 but well you know and they shocked Kilkenny in that semi-final and um, you know Richie Murray out midfield they gave it loads in the in the throw-in before the game uh, Eugene Clown in a goal with with a, you know I think it was a kick into the back of the neck Kevin Broderick the solo and ball over over the Kenny defender's head like they're a brilliant team in semi-finals they're afraid of no one in semi-finals mm-hmm. even go back to 0-5 the only other in semi-final our team lost was that 0-5 one against Galway and she- Shefflin said after the last game he's waiting for the team to spark well, they, they sparked in 05, <laughs> and they have often sparked in semi finals. Um, 015, go back to 15 when uh, the, the, the Tipperary, the great Tipperary team of the Callanans and Noel McGrath and that, they were hot favourites in that final. Galway turned them over again in 17, Tipperary All Ireland champions. So they have history. They have history in the They wanted to hang in there. I was listening to Scahill on the hurling pod a couple of weeks ago making the point, you know, people sort of talk about uh, Galway at times as if there's some sort of mental weakness and that they collapse. Like, if actually, if you look at as you go through their championships over the last decade even, generally it's one score. One score. They're there right till the bitter end so they can hang on in there and maybe just, like, it's a bit of confusion as to where Limerick are. Obviously, Declan Hanna been out injured. There's been a few injuries. Keane Lynch, still not sure as to exactly where he is. And like, is there a pressure of the four in a row? Like when you think back to 2009 and Kilkenny getting the four in a row, was that a was that a ye coming back to the pack or was that Tip catching up? Yeah, well, I definitely think in zero four. Um, it was hugely intense when we were going for the three in a row. That time you couldn't do a three in a row. Mm. If, if, if you remember that time, like to do a two in a row was, was an amazing feat. So to do it a three in a row was like going to be historic. And definitely zero four that year. The whole year was like Limerick's year this year. It was tough. You were fighting against the fight all year long. And eventually Cork Blue was away in the mm. All-Ireland final. Just, I think it was a 17 points to nine. Just kind of a cakewalk nearly near the end, really. Like, you know, the whole fight. I wouldn't say the fight was gone out, was, but the freshness was definitely gone and Limerick have been like that so far now the only thing for Limerick is it happened so early in the season like they were flying it in the league suddenly they went through that round robin so have they had four weeks now to just freshen up remember John Kiley was talking about you know giving them a week off and then we'll get going for the mm-hmm. semi-final like he is the master of psychology um, but like, freshness is, isn't something you can fake the, oh absolutely not but if they did take a week off and you know possibly took it easy like the pressure when you talk about freshness is that a is that a physical thing or a mental thing it's mostly mindset it's a um, in in my view like remember um, Bill Hensey used to play for Tullerone he he was on the Kenny team in the you know 92, 93 uh, and a couple of years at 91 as well a couple of years after that but the great Willie O'Connor used to say to him that time he'd rather be fresh than fit (laughs) and he's huge (laughs) you know because when you're when you're fresh you're hungry. You'd go off. You'd win a ball you shouldn't win. The ball would be there, and you'll do. You'll put in your foot. You'll put in your hand. You'll put in your head. I remember Larry Murphy in the was it the ninety six or ninety seven Leinster final. It was a Jerry Canning or the lad said during the game watching it. Larry Murphy he put in his head, or other lads wouldn't put their hurl. You know, that's freshness. Mm. That's hunger. That's savagery, and that's what you need when you come because usually when you get to semi-final stage and final stage there's not much between the teams and it could be that one like you take Limerick and all their greatness and all their all-conquering team they win a lot of matches be a point or two mm. so one lad putting in his head where another lad put, wouldn't pose Earl could turn them over you know and I thought Claire did that earlier on in the year because eventually they only ended up wouldn't be a point or two so it could be that one tackle like people always say about the mistakes Jesus, if we didn't make that mistake mistakes happen and if you, if you don't 
go for it you won't ever make mistakes but it could be the ball that we'll say if you if you think of the ball that you go for not the mistake that you made but if I had to win for that ball a diving block maybe or a, a flick or win for you know uh, follow your man instead of not following him that one time that could be the difference in turning over a team so um, yeah listen will Limerick have that the weekend who knows they've dealt with a lot of controversies this, you know red cards yellow cards injuries huge amount of long term injuries over the, over the time possibly maybe the likes of like I have them down with a couple of just superstars Sean Finn Keane Lynch will be two of them mm. Finn is out Keane Lynch is you know hasn't been playing lately um, so they could have huge impacts on the when, team when you're talking about freshness and, and, and even mental freshness Tommy like do you, so do you mean like I guess when there's a one week gap between matches you're, you're straight back onto the training pitch for recovery and all the rest on the Monday or Tuesday no time to really relax whereas maybe if you have a two week break you can have a couple of pints on the Saturday night or Sunday night or maybe the takeaway on the Sunday night as well and, and not feel too bad about it is just is it that opportunity to, to park it and remove yourself from from the game that you mean yeah I think two weeks is probably short as well right. Shane so you're probably more looking at three weeks yeah um, two weeks is still short um, th- thousand and I'd say it was 13 I think it was 13 we played um, Dublin in Port Leash and um, no it was 12 the year Galway Bez in the Linster final we were absolutely psyched for I think Dublin were after beating his league final year before so we still had that kind of hanging over us uh, up in his league final bet as well and the daily was over him so we had Port Dublin and Port Leash and the Leinster semi-final year after 2012 and they were um, you know people were starting to tip him to, to, to beat us so we were absolutely you know on the money for not two weeks I'd say six months <laughs> waiting for this game and um, we you know absolutely I'd say played out of our skins that day the Leinster final was two weeks later and we weren't ready for it mm. Galway blew us out of, out of the water so I would say probably three four weeks and that's why I would, I would give Limerick the chance of freshness coming back is it four weeks since the Munster final that's a, that's a week off and then probably two weeks of you know in-house games and then this week probably freshen off again so I give him this, this four weeks could have been huge to the freshness of Limerick can it be too big a gap for Limerick not if you have a great team and a great panel because you can have great matches in training I think the four or five week break six week break if you rewind back to the Munster champions over the years they used to suffer they used to win a Munster final for the first time in years they'd have a six week break to the semi-final and they'd get beaten but the, the teams with the great panels I felt had a much bigger advantage because you would have them challenge matches against players that were just as good if not better than the starting team mm. in training uh, like if you, you know if you look at this Limerick team at the moment we'll say you know they're marking subs that you know Keane Lynch you know these guys Richie English you know so the subs are brilliant all Peter Casey on and off um, you know Graham Mulcahy so you can imagine marking them lads in training you're getting ready for it all day probably for the two days previous just to have a great day in training so the teams with the big panels have a huge advantage in that sense and I'd say Galway do have a good panel this year Clear have a very good panel you know you have, you have guys on and off that Ian Galvin's on and off the team you know um, you know great backs in there you know Flanagan and Sean Amore the lads on and off that field so I think the four teams left in it have good panels can I just ask you one last thing on uh, Limerick then and the way they set up with you know you talk about the superstars Declan Hannon is like the steady Eddie in that mm-hmm. team like yeah. the captain guaranteed 8 out of 10 minimum in every game who replaces Hannon so Hannon I would imagine you won't change around your team too much so I'd say um, probably Colin Collum will, will come in um, I'd say centre her back like uh, unless they bring over Kyle Hayes but he's so effective on mm. it, especially in Crow Park he kind of goes up and down that left wing underneath say if they're playing down to the Davin up and, up and down that Cusick stand and a lot of times people don't kind of follow him I'm sure Shefflin will probably have a, a man to mark him this this weekend but I wouldn't I'd be probably slow to take him out of the centre and just nip him Colin Coughlin straight in centre back but um usually you don't want to make too many changes um, to a team but Declan Hannon what Declan Hannon is is he, he's the guy that can the old school hover around centre back he lets Burns then go up a bit and do his shooting he lets Kyle Hayes go up and down because he's the one constant always there to cover the, the full back they, 
to do a lot of out balls the Limerick team they're probably the best team in the business are coming out with the ball in transition and he's there and you can't keep your eye up, off him either because he'll come up and hit the ball and run over the bar from from 70 yards so yeah no listen Hannon will be a huge loss but they have a good guy to come in and him from I saw Michael Dignan suggesting you know Limerick could, could throw a curve, curve ball and maybe throw Cian Lynch at 6 but allow Cahill O'Neill to go back in at 11 he was great off the bench in the Munster final like as well Like, but it may, as you say maybe it's too late in the day to make changes that drastic possibly is it? I think that's a bit drastic <laughs> yeah, like, that'd be a big one alright um, it wouldn't be one that he's you know if it, like Keane Lynch will be if we talk about Declan Hannon staying back in the pocket mm. Keane Lynch I would imagine that natural draw of him to go up and put the ball <laughs> over the bar and uh, probably his genius is in his creative genius like mm. you know that he's hovering around he's able to open up a, a defence with, with a split ball if he's back trying to be disciplined and covering back like like half of a, a defender's job is running back towards his own goal to help out and to take balls back off opposition forward so be probably oh, that's the, the ultimate it's Key Lynch as a defender maybe a bit of creative <laughs> genius in the half back line is, is exactly what they need yeah, yeah. You know? fresh and oh, all could defend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the brain is going off a massive insult there he <laughs> couldn't possibly do it yeah no not for me <laughs> No. The uh, the Clare Kilkenny game then on Sunday. Um, it appears it was recorded reports today. John Conlon and Dave McInerney are winning their their races. They're expected to feature, which is good news obviously for for Clare fans. That that's massive, isn't it? Like it could have been the turning point in the game. Conlon and McInerney not being fit. Yeah, well, it probably was last year. Yeah, semi final against Kilkenny. Conlon out and Tony Kelly hit, but kept by uh, Mikey Butler because Conlon is just in, like a half back line whatever about defending he has to be the like, guy getting the ball into the forwards mm. and if you have a good forward line like Clare have at the moment what they need is ball the more ball they get the better the more damage will do Mark Rogers in the corner Ian Galvin in the corner you know Peter Duggan will cause chaos with the high balls coming in for the Shane Odons and that coming in so I think John Connell is crucial because right his man might score a couple of points mm. but he's driving 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 all day long plus he's a spiritual leader of that Clare team if Lohan is the spiritual leader on the sideline John Connell is definitely on the team Tony Kelly will get the scores and he'll drive him from far line but in the backs people love a back that comes out with the ball and you know create it's huge you know opportunities for the forwards and Conlon is definitely that man we've seen him in the first time when his brother's wedding the, the huge scenes after that win when uh, Conlon was brilliant but listen you know he'll have his work cut out like um, the half back line McInerney I'm not sure what his injury was before the semi-final and all a lot about it but, or the Munster final but the half back line is crucial for them and like you go back to any all them winning teams like the half back lines are the guys that stop the ball going into a good full forward line and they're the team that drive on getting the ball into their own forward line so you have Dear Ryan who was probably having one of the seasons of his life McInerney on the other side mm. and uh, Conlon in the middle if you're a half forward you know you're not going to be like Mark and uh, any of them so I think it's it's huge for Clare that they that, that, that have John Conlon and then the big one will be Tony Kelly versus Mikey Butler like you know um, can Mikey Butler do it twice in a row very difficult to do a huge challenge for him but listen if anyone can do it Mikey can um, is it difficult to do it twice in a row uh, like, it is. Do you not, have you not figured it out the first time <laughs> you figured it out yeah and as soon as you have something figured out it's like golf I don't play golf with here lads you think if it figured out then it all goes <laughs> same as snooker Tommy I know you play snooker as well same yeah. thing you feel like once you've done it once you can, you can do it but it's not, it doesn't always be that simple I suppose yeah well there's so many variables in hurling especially like at least in maybe set piece games like that like you can maybe visualise and that but can happen in, in hurling like Tony runs one way the ball breaks another way suddenly you're you know but listen Tony wow, he scored 3-4 the last day like I said it there during the week that like if you score 3-4 tri- in training you expect Michael Lee Higgins come down the helicopter and <laughs> <laughs> shake her hand but uh, you know but amazing stuff like for him to be still doing it like at 29 or 30 years of age so that'll be huge but the one thing for Tony is the weekend he's huge backup if they do hold him you know Rogers is absolutely flying it in the corner Shane O'Donnell is in the form of his life you know he's now scoring you know 1-2 or 1-3 the last day he was I thought felt he fell into the trap the last couple of years before maybe last year of just I'm the provider I'll keep setting him up 
and um, score yourself if the opportunity is there and I think Shane is doing that again this year and mm. he had a, a massive couple of games now as well and definitely dog him if you have small players like Kelly and Rogers and Galvin these lads you need a few big lads to to, to, to do it up and Davy Fitzgerald he's an absolute rocket for a big man mm. you can know what he is 6 4 6 5 but speed you know when he goes he's gone and he can set up opportunities then for the lads so listen the, yeah the pressure won't be on just Conlon and Tony Kelly cl- clear of, of good forwards we should before I let you go Tommy get your, your predictions I know they're, they're probably two difficult games to, to call yeah. same as last year um, but how, how you feel both are yeah both sure are. the Kilkenny clear one I'm going to go with James Skehill's way of predicting things I think Kilkenny will win it because I really really want them to win <laughs> 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 yeah. I'm wrong with that yeah, yeah. yeah. so That's good logic <laughs> I liked it <laughs> and uh, in the first semi-final then I think Limerick Limerick are the champions Des- deserve to be favourites and it'll take a great team to stop them to have the four week break um said it time and time again freshness is crucial when you're champions mm. they've had four weeks now to freshen up they've keen Lynch now to come back in you know off of you'd imagine he'd be picked Sunday and be raring to go Hegarty hasn't been going particularly well Tom Morris and Galan were probably the main guys for the last couple of months really driving that team on uh, dear Burns but yeah I think Limerick will um, they will just um, pay it on Saturday Limerick the Kenny final Heard it here first. Yeah, go again. Get, exactly. We'll, we'll chat to you again before the before the final day. Tommy, thanks for yeah. for popping in as always. A pleasure. Thanks for, for being with us. Uh, Eight thirty four a.m. on this uh, Wednesday morning's OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from off the ball. I should mention as well the clip that you heard earlier from the uh, the football pod during the break is in partnership with AIB, proud sponsors of the football hurling and camogie all Ireland club championships. Check out the hashtag the toughest for more. Now we're going to turn our attention to the uh, rugby in the Irish under twenties uh, road, I guess, to the uh, semi finals of that world, uh, world championships down in South Africa. Alan Quinlan is joining us on the line this morning. Quinny, how are things? Hi, uh, good. Thanks, lads, and yourselves. Keeping well, Quinny. Uh, thanks for hopping on. Uh, it's been a, it's been a mad tournament for for more reasons than than one, Quinny. And of course, the Irish team has had to deal with a lot of um, a lot of terribly tragic circumstances around the, the group. Greg Oliver, of course, the uh, father of the uh, Irish scrum half Jack, uh, dying earlier this week uh, after a paragliding accident. And then you've the St Michael's pupils as well, Max Wall and Andrew O'Donnell, uh, dying on in separate incidents on the same holiday in Greece. Uh, and I know they would have both been uh, very friendly with. Different members of this uh, Irish under twenty squad. Uh, it's hard to get their head around it, and and an unbelievably brave um, performance yesterday under the, the circumstances. Yeah, it was um, obviously really difficult. I think Richie Murphy said that um, you know they they had to make a decision that the, the night before whether they were actually going to play the game or not, which was um, must have been really difficult. I think the shock and uh, the the unbelievable sadness that must have been in the group um, they must have been rocked by that whole thing given obviously what happened Andrew O'Donnell and Max Max um, Max Wall as well um, before um, they got the news of, of what happened to one of their teammates fathers um, you know Jack Oliver's dad Greg um, so it was a lot to take um, particularly when you're dealing with you know a, a, you know a match number of changes in the side all that kind of stuff and you probably think um, the sport isn't important here and how how are you going to kind of get yourself right to go out and play a match so um, very emotionally charged situation for them and um, they handle themselves amazingly well I think I think if you go through the performance of course there's there's a few mistakes and errors but that didn't um, that didn't matter I think the fact that they were able to go out onto the field and and get a result. So I think in honour, you know, Andrew O'Donnell, Max, Max Wall, and, and Greg Oliver, their families, um, and in particular their their their, their teammate Jack Oliver, who just had, had lost his dad in, in tragic circumstances. Um, it's hard to, to actually actually fathom how how they were able to do that and how they had the energy and kind of um, drive to go out and play a match. Look, I know they're. You know, it's a big game. It's a, it's a big tournament for them. Um, but just to get the heads right. So I think, you know, the players deserve huge credit for that, Shane, themselves. Um, they're young men who, you know, are learning in life. And, uh, you know, they're, 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 it's it's a lot to take for them. But I think Richie Murphy, who's done an amazing job with this group anyway in the last two seasons, um, 
you know, his guidance and the rest of his coaches and, and the management of the Ireland under 20s. Um, I'm sure they did a great job in, in trying to give give them support, but also giving them the option. And um, Richie Murphy kind of did give them the option whether they wanted to play or not. And, you know, they came together and uh, went out and, and got a result that they needed to get to put themselves into the semi-finals. They must be exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, and I, I was really proud to, to, to commentate in that game and really proud to see what they were doing yesterday. Um, as I said, r- incredibly tough situation for those, those guys. Uh, Greg Oliver uh, such a terrible tragedy down in South Africa a former Scotland international so a fine player in his own right but uh, went on to become uh, very much a monster man yeah he was uh, he was a wrong monster when I was playing there a lot um, whether he was doing stuff with the the academy underage players um, you know involving the A team getting them ready for matches um, he was ever present and, and I would see him a lot around the place um, he was a lovely fella uh, quiet unassuming um, and very popular with a lot of young players coming through because he would have been involved in, in their development and their skill development and um, yeah it's 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 just it's it's hard to fathom what, what how this happened and why it happened and, and that it actually happens really you know when you know, I think I was looking at the crowd just uh, Nathan, and and you see some, you see the parents in the crowd, and I actually felt for them because, you know, I know from my my own parents going to matches when I was younger, um, they become friends, the other parents, and and they create a bond, and they kind of, uh, my mum still has that with some of my ex teammates, parents, um, they're getting older, you know, it's been a while since we all played together, but. It's a lovely kind of part of, of being, um, you know, going on that journey. With, you see your parents connect with the other parents and looking at the crowd just uh, like they, they they were, even their celebrations for some of the tries that Ireland scored, they were, it was subdued because um, Greg would have been part of that group for the last um, period of time, himself and his wife. And I'm sure they're absolutely rocked and devastated by that as well. That's, you know, a part, someone part of their group um, supporting the team. Um, so yeah, it's 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 hard to it's hard to put it into words really. And, and you know, my thoughts and prayers are with with his family. Um, I can't bear thinking what it's been like for for Jack Oliver to to get that news. You know, last week he came off the bench against Australia and. Um, he was smiling and delighted and happy and joyful and that's the situation in one moment he's involved in a game here he's on the bench against against Fiji and and you get that news that something like that has happened so um, incredibly hard and sad and difficult situation and um, you know Greg was very popular with everybody I think you even see the you know ex, I, I saw Craig Chalmers tweeting about it as other Scottish internationals um Every, he was a very popular person and um, loved his rugby. Colin McMahon, who um, worked with him a lot in Munster. Um, you know, I read a statement from Colum yesterday um, speaking about, you know, his enthusiasm for the game. Um, I actually just... He's just one of these coaches, Nathan, you see he's out there like half an hour before any session and he's getting calls ready and, and it's just, it's there, it's his life, you know. And he's had various different roles with the Ireland under 20s. Gary Owen was his club, uh, Munster. He coached Cashel at one stage. Um, his enthusiasm and love for the game um, was second to none. And, you know, for... for, for uh, a guy like that to go and support your son and kind of go on a trip of a lifetime and and, and, and for that to happen is is just incredibly unfortunate and, and sad um, but he was a very popular fella and uh, it's a really tough situation for everybody yeah definitely and echo those sentiments as well Quinny the thoughts of everyone at uh, Off The Baller with the families of Max Wall and Andrew Donnell and Greg Oliver as well so that's a, a tragedy on an unimaginable scale for the for the team that, that are over there as well and for those families in particular um, and on the pitch and it, look it, it feels almost um, shallow to be talking about matters on pitch after uh, such a tragic week but um, 47 points to 27 win over Fiji are now advanced to the, to the semi-finals of this World Under 20 Rugby Championship as winners of their pool as well and um, 
and, and they showed so much strength yesterday, Quinny. But to, to, to race into that lead and then I, I guess to to stay composed when Fiji came back into the game was one of the more impressive things. Yeah, one of, one of the attributes and, and, and qualities you decide, Shane, is is their is their character and the resilience. They've shown that uh, throughout the Six Nations when they've been under pressure. When you know, I would go right back to the first game um, against Wales when Wales kind of went ahead a few times in that game in that first half and looked like they were turning the tides and going to pull away. Um, you know, there's no panic in this group. They went up the field and, and got the the scores when they needed to and they did that throughout the championship and again in this tournament you know you go back to that game against England to start when they drew um, you know they they came back twice in the game got a, a good lead in the in the 65th minute got England took the lead and, and uh, or England came back and levelled it and looked like they were going to win it um, so there's, there's one thing that they really have is great strength of character and that comes from obviously from good coaching and, and the type of person people you have in, in the team um, but they have a lot of good leaders as well who don't panic so you know, yesterday, obviously, we've we've spoken about how difficult it would would have been, given what was on their minds. Um, but you know, there was no panic again in that second half. The game got a bit loose. They were comfortable at half time. Um, their line out and their kickoff receipts were were poor yesterday, and that caused them problems. When 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 their structure was good, I think they were able to you know keep. <laughs> deny Fiji of any sort of possession and uh, the game opened up a little bit and then the two tries after high, half time and it's back to within four points you're thinking this is this is trouble for Ireland um, but they kicked on again and and, and um, got the scores and the win that they they rightly deserved really I think and um, you know they could feel very good about themselves I'm sure they were as I said emotionally drained um, there was a lot of changes in that side yesterday which is always a risky situation for any team but Richie Murphy had to make those changes given the the quick turnaround of these matches um, so you know w there was a few mistakes but there was a lot of players who stepped up again and said, and showed that you know they have big futures in front of themselves and um, on that really on those players that, that have stood up uh, because you know you, you've spoken a lot there about the character of uh, the game yesterday but also like those first couple of games the conditions were so tough like this was a group that just had to stick together and really grind it out but when you look at the individuals and the skill sets that they're bringing who are the who are the guys that have stood out in the first few games well, uh, you know, we've highlighted Brian Gleeson and, and again, um, he was the one forward that started from from uh, from the Australian game. There was seven seven different guys in there um, yesterday. I think um, yeah, I think they've shown their depth in the squad. You know, um, Danny Sheehan played at hooker, Fiona Barrett. Um, they're guys who've been coming off the bench in 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 the Six Nations. Um, Evan O'Connell, um, really good yesterday um, as well. And um, then you had Joe Hopes coming into the side, um, and and uh, Dan Barron, Dan Barron making his debut. I thought he's played really well. So these are the guys that played yesterday. But if you if you if you kind of look at the big names who've been delivering, I like, say they're big names. You know, Conor O'Tiernig, uh, Ruan Quinn, Brian Gleeson. Uh, James McNabney, who unfortunately he's going to miss the, you know, he, he may be back if they get to a final. He got suspended. Um, the captain has been brilliant, Gus McCarthy. You know, he's he's been a real leader for them. Um, John Devine in the centre. I said that in commentary. You know, he's he's been ever present in this team and, and a superb player. Um, so there's a lot of them there. There's, you know, I think Andrew Osborne, Hugh Gavin, these guys, Henry McAleen, the fullback, superb. Um, they've got continuity and I think look re the reality is they know his best team are, are the likes of those guys that I've mentioned um, a lot of the players yesterday are backing them up um, but very closely backing them up which is you know a great sign of, of the, the, the depth that he's uh, that Richie Murphy has developed with this side so um, who knows whether it'll be good enough or not but I think you know in, in a really tough group um, particularly the, the England and Australia games they were always going to be really tricky Australia before this tournament there was a lot of talk that um, they could kind of really challenge for this for this tournament and this competition so um, they've done remarkably well again and I think you know they play South Africa now in a semi-final which is 
Um, there I say it, it's one that you kind of think I'll have a really good chance, even again, it's against the hosts at home. But um, they've shown their own flaws and vulnerabilities as well. South Africa, they're a very powerful side. But hopefully Ireland can regroup now um, and and deal in, an, in whatever way they need to in the next couple of days and get ready for that game on Sunday. Are those things that you mentioned, the, the line-outs and the, the restarts maybe not being up to scratch uh, as they had been in previous games, is that a concern going forward to the semi-final or is that just because of, I guess, as you say, all the changes made to the team? I think it was 10 changes in all made by Richie Murphy. Is it a concern? Uh, well, it's always a concern. Um, it, is it a catastrophe? No. Um, it, of course, it's a concern. And these are things that look at the very top level of the game. It can happen in certain matches where there's a breakdown of communication. The opposition are putting pressure on your line out. Um, things just start to go wrong and it snowball has a snowball effect. I think it's crucial if Ireland want to get to a final and try and challenge and try and win this, um, it's an area they have to get better at. Um, there's, there's, it's probably a, a mixture of timing issues. Um, and it wasn't just in yesterday's game. There was, there was, there was a couple of lineouts in, in the Australian England game that, um, that they lost as well. Um, I think the changes probably yesterday. There was more lineouts that they lost, and there was more breakdowns in that communication and that that whole package. Um, that was probably down to the change as well. New players coming in, um, not doing it on a regular basis against quality opposition who are throwing players up in the lineout. Do you know what I mean? You can do it in training all day long. Um, the the kickoff receipts. It, it's a coach's nightmare, really. If you score. Um, a try or a penalty and you're receiving a kickoff and you knock it on or you don't gather it and the opposition get the ball and they get a score um, it's the most frustrating part of the game for me and most coaches would probably say the same um, you want to win that kickoff set something up and get into the opposite opposition's half again that can be draining as a player when teams do that really well and good teams do that so um, they can fix it of course they can they've got to work on this um, get their time and right um, sometimes simplify things I think they're a very brave side and they've a lot of courage so you know they throw a lot of balls to the tail of the line of it, whereas on occasions um, it's maybe just about winning it at the front sometimes and being pragmatic and you know, I spoke after the England game, maybe a little bit of game management around the kicking game, particularly now if you're you're in you're you're in a semi final. Um, territory is vital, doing the simple things really well. It sounds boring because I think they can play and we've seen that. Um, but they're the things that they need to be better at going forward. And, you know, I think if they can get into a final, France are obviously everybody's favourites and three bonus point wins they've demolished all three three oppositions that they've played against and they look incredibly powerful um, but if Ireland were to get there and um, you know it'd be a wonderful achievement and they could have a real crack at it but obviously it's got to got to play a good South African side first um, but I think you know being in a semi-final is, is, is a really good return so far but they'll want more before we let you go, Quinny, we should ask you about this uh, new biennial tournament for the Six Nations and, and Sanzar teams. So, big changes to the to the rugby calendar on the horizon. Uh, so, this is going to come in from 2026, we're told. Um, and Six Nations working with Sanzar, this organisation, which includes South Africa, New Zealand, Australia and Argentina. Uh, this is going to take place in the existing July and November international windows. Uh, it will feature all the Six Nations and Sanzar teams and then two further spaces reserved for invitational unions, which will join the Southern Hemisphere group. Apparently, players were involved in this uh, process as well in terms of coming up with with this um, new addition to the calendar what are your your thoughts after hearing about it this week yeah it's not completely ratified yet obviously it goes to the World Rugby Council meeting in October I think and it, it, it will be ratified I think it will be um, I think there's mixed views obviously I think particularly if you look online um, there's a lot of concern around tier two nations um, that you know they won't get to play the top nations for potentially four years I, I see regular comments saying that you know Georgia who they're under 20s did really well uh, they beat Argentina they just missed out on points difference of, of getting into the semi-finals you know they mightn't play a tier one nation for four years because this is every two years now in between Lions Tours and World Cups um, on the face of it yes it, it will really kind of um, intensify the competition regarding the July test windows 
uh, the summer test windows and November test windows that they're now going to be um, not what the, the rugby haters sometimes describe as friendlies anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, that they're going to be competitive now and there's going to be points on the board to qualify for, you know, in, the, in this nation's league. Um, I do I, I do think the, 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 re, the promotion relegation thing, which doesn't come into place for the first two tournaments, if I'm right in saying that. So from 2026 to 20, 2030, it's ring-fenced. Um, I would have brought the promotion relegation into it straight away mm. um, and give those Tier 2 nations um, an opportunity to, you know, to, to challenge and improve. So I think, look, the, the rugby will be better. Um, it will be more competitive in a sense that there's really something on the line now. You know, I played in te- the test matches many times and they never felt like friendlies to me. Uh, but I think it is an opportunity to grow the game, but they must, World Rugby must not forget about the Tier 2 nations because um, it's it's to, to make the improve the game which uh, and to improve its appeal globally, I think, is part of the reason they're doing this. But there is a concern that the tier two nations now could fall back a little bit. There'll obviously be money TV rights from this. Um, it's been driven by Six Nations and Sanzar. Um, they've got to really be mindful of what happens to tier two nations here. And again, hopefully when we see it in action and see it in place, it will be beneficial to everyone and improve the game. Yeah, exactly. I agree with you. I think the Jeopardy straight away would be probably making more sense. But um, listen, we'll keep an eye on it anyway. Quinny, great stuff as always. Thanks for hopping on this morning. Cheers, lads. Thanks. Putting stuff on Quinlan there at 8.54 a.m. on this Wednesday morning's O2B AM, the sports breakfast show from Off the Ball with myself and Nathan with you until 10 o'clock this morning. Still to come, Jason Quigley, the Donegal boxer, will be with us uh, live in the studio. But before all that, the uh, Olympian, Stacey Flood, Irish seven star. How are things? I'm not an Olympian yet. But, um, <laughs> you will be hopefully an Olympian. Yeah. One day. Touch, touch wood. We'll touch Once you're an Olympian, Olympian, you're always an Olympian. I remember uh, we had a panel one day with three Olympians, and uh, Gary O'Toole, the great swimmer, was in, and I uh, went through his uh, list of achievements and introduced him as uh, Gary O'Toole. I said former Olympian, and he uh, corrected me and said, "Once, once an Olympian, always an Olympian." <laughs> it's fair. I'll let you know if I ever get there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, uh, everyone gets the rings, don't they? The tattoo of the Olympic rings is that a don't still a don't yeah, Ricky, thing? Fowler, Ricky Fowler won the uh, big golf tournament in America on Sunday night and he has the uh, straight away he has the rings no he has the rings oh, sorry, he has the rings. Them, yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah when yeah, he was yeah, you yeah. can see it yeah I think most of the sevens lads have them so uh, it's kind of awaiting our team hopefully yeah absolutely you're thinking about it you're trying to, you're trying to play it cool here yeah uh, tonight it's, it'd be nice to have the, the men's and women's team both there I mean that's that's a, a massive thing in and of itself yeah like it's a massive achievement I think it's the first um, men, men and women's team uh, from the same sport to ever qualify for an Olympic so I think that's an achievement in, in itself and then obviously like it's just grown the sport so much already and hopefully that still continues yeah what do what does the next year I guess look like? How do how do how do you prepare for an Olympic Games? Is is it tournament after tournament? Is it a lot of preseason and relaxing, or, or how does it look? Yeah, so we actually finished yesterday for our off season. Yes. Um, so I can't remember the last time I had an off season, but um, it's, it's here now. Um, so we have five weeks off, and then we're in back in on the fourteenth of August for a block of preseason, and then we have a preseason kind of tournament games and um, they're actually in Ireland so hopefully people can come uh, around and watch that so I think uh, Australia are going to come over maybe one or two other teams um, to play against us and then another week off or two and then another pre-season block and then um, into the World Series in Dubai and Cape Town in November December yeah it's a lot of it's a lot of travel and a lot of playing like when you look at the, the different places I think you've been to Dubai early December then your tournaments in Cape Town, Hamilton, Sydney, Vancouver, Hong Kong. Like you've travelled the world essentially with this team. Yeah, um, and some of the locations are the same, but they vary each year. Um, so you're kind of just travelling, obviously to do a job and to work hard, uh, which is the basis of our team because it's high performance. But with a group of girls who you have a common goal with and that you get along with, so in that sense like you're travelling the world with your friends and it's it's quite special and unique so I think yeah we're very lucky to do what we do and to play where we play like hopefully one day we can have a tournament in Ireland and we can get a home crowd and even get more of a following so yeah 
was Olymp- qualifying for an Olympics always an amb- I know Bevan Parsons was in with us or on with us at one stage a couple of months ago and she she had always that ambition of getting to an Olympic Games by hook or by crook in some sport I guess mm-hmm. Has, was that always on your radar or is that just something that's come about um, when I was younger obviously I always watched the Olympics but I never played an Olympic sport mm. like as a young girl growing up playing uh, football for Clannagale um, all I wanted to do was play in Crow Park and that would have been my idea of the, the pinnacle and then obviously as I grew up and I got more into watching the Olympics and I was like actually sevens became an Olympic sport uh, like after I started playing so I was like oh my god this could actually be a goal um, and now I've been in the programme eight or nine years and we've failed to qualify for two Olympics so obviously like that's heartbreaking and you've only had this goal for however long but now that we've done it I'm like oh my god it's happened like how like it doesn't feel real and it still doesn't feel real and when it happened like every, I think everyone if you've seen the last few minutes of our game that we qualified through everyone just looked numb breath legless like everyone was just couldn't believe what was happened and I do think like for some athletes like Baven Parsons and Amy Lee Murphy Crow like they're such like athletes that yeah, they probably could have qualified through another sport if they wanted to, but the fact that they get to do it in a team sport with the group of girls we have, I feel like it's it's so special because we're just, I feel like it's so unique and everything's just come together at the right time. I guess the difference for the very young players in the squad is that they could dream of an Olympics when they came in because it was a possibility, whereas you say when you started out, it wasn't even, it wasn't even a sport at the Olympics <laughs> to even think about. Did it, when it did become an Olympic sport, did it change your mindset around sevens rugby that like this now became a attainable target yeah like it's something obviously you think about and you really want and at the time of our first qualifier realistically did I think we were going to qualify we could we had a chance but I didn't feel like the team was at that point in time ready and I do think yes it did change things for the fact that oh my god there's an Olympics on the line here but um, realistically going out and representing your country at a world on a world stage like the world series is such an honor and like I never had that goal even playing GAA so I think that was such an honor in itself that every time I get to put on that green jersey I was so grateful and so lucky that and now I could do that at an Olympics with um, like a whole group of other athletes and d- everyone's like going for the same goal for Olympic medals so I think that's even more special because it's on a bigger scale now You probably spend a lot of time out in the High Performance Centre out in uh, Abbottstown so <laughs> there's a lot of Olympians uh, whether it's uh, the men's team or just in various different codes hanging around mm-hmm. and uh, I think it was Ellen Keane said one of the best things is you're just talking to people in that high performance mindset have you spoken to people already about yeah. what it's actually like? Yeah it's funny because that's um, all the like individual athletes uh, training Sport Ireland and we have like a different building uh, for the Irish Irish rugby and um, so we actually don't see them day to day we're like just in our little bubble if you right. want to call it but um, I know that the Sport Ireland and the IRFU were working on getting more meetings or like once a week breakfasts with those people with those other athletes which will be really beneficial for us and I do think like for people who have been there before like there's a lot of questions and like kind of hopefully it's not too big of a shock when we get there because you don't want to be struck when you get to an Olympics mm. and kind of just sit and just be in awe Overall too much it, yeah. yeah like you don't want to be afraid of it so hopefully that we can kind of break down that barrier and kind of just arrive and be ready to play then yeah and the great thing is it's in Paris so yeah. you know it's accessible for all your family <laughs> you, you, the, the credit union loans will be manageable <laughs> enough for everybody so yeah 100% every uh, I have a big family I've come from uh, six kids I'm the youngest of six so um, we've uh, we've really big uh, support a lot of you gotta sort out <laughs> yeah. no well so the thing was they had got their tickets before we qualified because it's like a a lottery system so yeah. you have to uh, you have to put your name in and then you get a lottery and then you can buy your tickets within like 38 hours or or 48 hours or whatever and uh, they put it in the family group and I was like no one put this in the family group I do not want to see it I was like get it away from me I don't want to see anything about tickets I was like we're not there yet we haven't qualified um, I was like make a separate group and then obviously your mum and dad like um, I was at home and they were like Stacey we need your help and I was like no I was like, <laughs> I was like ring somebody else I'm not helping you it's like buy tickets for this 
um, just the fear of it and it's such an Irish thing to not have that like sense of Confidence. oh yeah be grand like you know the yeah, confidence you don't want to curse it like, either yeah, yeah it's totally a curse yeah, yeah, like yeah, and you're yeah. like oh if I say it out loud it's not gonna happen like whereas like now everyone's like if you say it out loud it'll happen <laughs> so now I'm like totally swayed I'm like if you say it, it's gonna happen Manifest then, it would have yeah. needed uh, to keep the separate uh, whatsapp group if you hadn't qualified anyways and they were all over in Paris <laughs> at yeah, the games it's like what are you doing for the weekend they're like don't oh mind. we can go to yeah, something else yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah even this morning they're like putting accommodation in the in the family group and it's it's crazy money but like they're putting in the family group I'm like stop talking about it I'm not there yet yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like we've qualified but there's still a whole year now to build up to it so you don't want to jinx anything all I'm doing is like touching wood and banging my head every day have you spoken <laughs> about that I know it's still quite recent uh, the qualification but like this is such a big thing in your lives that it's going to dominate your next year but yeah. at the same time you can't let it be yeah. everything that you need to go through the steps as you said to make sure you're in the squad yeah. uh, to make sure you don't mentally drain yourself across the year just thinking about this one thing yeah like and that's what it was for this year around qualification because obviously not having qualified twice before like and you're in a position now to qualify through the first route of the World Series so like we went the whole year being like are we going to qualify are we not and we put ourselves 16 points ahead with three or four tournaments to go so we're like oh my god this is really highly likely mm -hmm. and then you're just like getting excited but you're like you can't get excited then us being us and making it hard we dropped out for two tournaments like dropped down points wise last tournament two points ahead of Fiji four points ahead of GB so it's coming down to this last tournament and we're like how have we done this to ourselves yeah. but then it was like all part of the story all part of the journey like you couldn't have written it and then to just go and do it then and I think that that whole year was what we're going to experience again this year so putting a name on it like not not speaking about it because if you don't speak about it you'll get there and you'll be literally oh no we're here now and all these feelings come rushing at you so I, like we don't want that to happen and I think we've learned valuable lessons this year with, with qualifying and we've been working with um, Siobhan uh, our sports psych <laughs> she does wonders for us um, so give her a little shout out but um, yeah no we've been working with um, her as a team and honestly I, I didn't know what I was missing until we went and done those group sessions like it brought us all together on a different level and really all connected sort of us just like putting a name on things like we had like a little theme around our last tournament to lose because we knew that it was going to be such a big deal but we didn't want to get there and then be shell shocked by it so I think together we came up with a team and we just said we were going to be present and be together and just like just go and do it and like we're all on this journey together and it was our first way of qualifying we did have two other routes to fall back on but as a team we knew that we wanted to go and do it and like I think that meant so much more and us just being connected and being on the same page we all knew that if everyone's on the same page and we buy in and we're all in like it's going to happen for us yeah, the yeah. theming thing seems to be something that's cropped up a lot recently Ronan McGar I know uses theming a lot in his La Rochelle uh, coaching setups but that, that's the tough thing about the Olympics as well like it's a four year cycle so yeah. like when you, if you don't qualify for two Olympic Games all of a sudden you're <coughs> you're talking eight years all of a sudden gone. you're 26 years old and then you're on the third cycle yeah. <laughs> yeah. it's mad though but that, that must add a little bit of pressure to it as well yeah like and I think that's what people perceive it as and it is pressure but if that's how you think about it you're going to actually be in that situation yeah. where you let the feelings get over you it's like when I used to play GAA it was like when we got to a county final it was like play the game not the occasion and obviously that's a really hard thing to do because it's all different but if you go about your processes in the same way hopefully it won't be that much different and you can still get performances Was that ultimately a tough decision for you to, to opt for rugby eventually over GAA I know you're, like your sister Kim would have been like playing the Dublin team and the Irish rugby team as well so like I'm sure you would have looked up to her but was that a tough decision for you to ultimately make yeah I, lo I love talking about Kim <laughs> she's she's one of my favourites right. uh, sport players but um and to be fair I'm so lucky I had that like female like athlete to look at when I was growing mm. up because it's, it wasn't that visible so I was very lucky to have someone who actually was just pushing boundaries all the time and yeah she wanted to go train and I was like oh I'll just come with you like mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I kind of just followed a path she led um, but 
yeah like I feel like it was natural for me to go towards rugby then when I started playing and the opportunities I was given it was quite a natural journey and path for me to take I didn't start playing rugby till I was 16 17 where I played GAA since I was eight years eight years right. of age um, and I played a bit of soccer as well but um, I didn't have a first touch so I was no good <laughs> um, but like I was quite lucky that Kim started rugby three or four years before me and I was like oh no I don't really think it's for me um, I just want to play GA and she was like oh no like sevens isn't too like uh, too much contact like it's just all one on ones it's like quite a skillful fast game like you're you're GA skills will transfer over and I was I didn't believe her I'm not gonna lie I, I didn't actually believe her and then I saw her training away and she was getting really fit and I was like oh maybe I'll do it on the off season of GAA to get fit like this is totally like what I was thinking as like 16, 17 year old yeah. I was like oh double minor like I'll stay fit off on the off season I'll, I'll go and play rugby sevens like and I, that's what I started with I didn't start with 15 so that's why I like it's my first love of rugby is sevens um, and I was quite lucky that I got opportunities when I was younger so I was playing for the Dublin minors and at the same time I was doing underage sevens um, and going playing in the school games in the UK and then we played in Sweden in the European Championships and then from there I went straight into the senior squad and I went to a trip to San Diego San Diego uh, 18 people got to go because the coach changed at the time and I was so lucky because I was like oh my god I'm over the other side of the world and I'm with all these girls and they're all so driven and so competitive and I'm like this is a great lifestyle mm -hmm. and I then I was sold I was like oh I'm gonna have to put GAA on the back foot and try try my hand at this because if I can have a chance to represent my country like that's such a big achievement and then me and Kim actually ended up getting capped for sevens together and playing on the series Amazing. for a year or two together so that's obviously such an achievement for both of us but it felt so natural because we grew up playing like um, Gaelic games together and mm -hmm. stuff so so Proud it's, parents it's really there, nice. I imagine. I'm not saying I'm the favourite child or anything, but... <laughs> Are you the youngest of six? You have to be. The, like the, uh, <laughs> my family, the brother's the youngest of four, and he's definitely the favourite. I think the youngest... Well, you're particularly bitter about that, though. You bring yeah. up quite a lot. <laughs> he's an inch taller than me as well, so... Oh, yeah. I'm parents. actually the tallest girl oh, yeah. in the family, but <laughs> yeah. Not at all, no, yeah. I'd say my brother's my mum's favourite. My brother, the youngest boy, is my mum's favourite, but my dad does have a soft spot for me now, I have the to say. parents are watching, I guarantee they won't, they won't admit that, but uh, they'll be keen No, they to, never admit it, but no. he never says no. Well, there you go, yeah, yeah. No, no denial. Uh, well, listen, Stacey, it's a, it's a massive achievement, and uh, fair play to you all for, for, for achieving it, and I know there's going to be a long build-up now for the next year, but yeah. enjoy it, and, and do will check in before. Yeah. Did you get to play in Crow Park? No. <laughs> Still on the list, Kim right? did, though. She did, right, yeah, right, right. Kim right. did. One day, hopefully, yeah. maybe I'll get, like, the... Um, one of those charity games. Well, I'll tell you what, no, <laughs> get yourself an Olympic medal and they'll bring you onto the pitch at a uh, yeah, half yeah, yeah. All final. <laughs> Hopefully. You never know. Yeah. Once I get there, if I get there, touch wood. Exactly. Again. That's the look of it. Listen, yeah. thanks for coming in. Thanks Stacey. very much for yeah. having me. Great to chat to you. Stacey Flood there from the Irish uh, Sevens team at uh, 10 past nine on this Wednesday morning's OTBM, the sports breakfast show from off the ball. Just want to mention uh, Galway Kenny, but not as you know it. The Hurling Pod Live is off to the Bulgosh Energy Theatre in Dublin this July and you are invited. We'll be joined on stage by the co host James. Skell and Paul Murphy as well as special guest Joe Canning and more hurling legends to be announced very soon as we debate the 2023 season and preview the All-Ireland Hurling Final it's July 20th at the Borgosh Energy Theatre it's an exclusive off-air event tickets are limited so don't delay go to offtheball.com forward slash events all ticket proceeds as well will go to the Dylan Quirk Foundation and Focus Ireland get your tickets now and have a great cause Borgosh Energy proud sponsors of the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Championship here are some highlights coming up on the OTP Podcast Network for today and my uh, chat with Gavin Mizuno from yesterday will be up a slight tangent which featured traitor Colin Buhig who went from AM to PM last night and Rugby Daily after the break we're going to have the Donegal boxer Jason Quigley live in studio and during the break more from Gavin Mizuno talking about his season at Southampton back in a sec You're listening to OTB AM have you subscribed to the OTB Football Podcast? I think Brendan Rodgers is a good manager. I know people don't like him because he has self-confidence. But his teams play good football. If there was an Ireland job in the future... So I don't know. I think Brendan Rodgers as a future Ireland's manager. I, I could get behind this. Subscribe now to the OTB Football Podcast stream wherever you get your podcasts and download the OTB Sports app.
Uh, how do you feel like now that the, the club season is over? I mean, a debut season with Southampton, I think you played maybe the first 32, 33 league games, which was quite incredible. Um, and then, of course, the tail end of the season was a bit more difficult after that, that three-all draw um, with Arsenal, I think it was. Um, but, but how do you assess the season as a whole? A lot of experience under your belt, I guess, is one way to look at it. Yeah, definitely a lot of experience. I think the main feeling is obviously disappointment for for the end result of being relegated. Um, and I think that's a burden that's placed not just on me, but on the on the whole team. And I think that's uh, going to drive us uh, and give us that hunger to hopefully go in next season and get us back to where we belong. But on a personal note, I think it was a very, very good season for me to be able to get the amount of games that I was able to get, get the experience that I was able to get. And, um, you know, also to prove that I, I can play at that level. Some of my best games were against some of the top teams in the world. So for me, it was a, a proven point to me and some other people that I was capable of playing that level. OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball 13 minutes past 9 on this Wednesday morning's OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off the Ball with myself and Nathan until 10 o'clock Delighted to have the Donegal boxer Jason Quigley live in studio back in with us How are you keeping? Good lad, good Delighted to be back in with you How's things? Keeping well You were at uh, Madison Square Garden Edgar Berlanga uh, retained the NABO Super Middleweight title but a really impressive performance I think everyone will agree from, from yourself How do you feel off the back of it? Yeah, um Coming around a bit now to it, it was um, obviously you know it was disappointing. Yeah. Like um, coming away at the the wrong end of the decision. But since I've come home and since you know I have read a few comments and listened to a few people and not too many people because <laughs> sometimes you can listen to too much. But um, you know people close to me and people that opinion that I respect. Um, it's weird because everyone's coming up saying well done congratulations mm. do you know um, I was just so happy with the performance um, in terms of I think I put a bit of respect and a, a marker back on my name again mm. you know after the Andrade fight in boxing there's a great saying you're only as good as your last fight <laughs> you know and I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that'll resonate with and for me you know with Andrade fight yes it was great fighting for a world title and, and there's not many people get to do that but going out the way that I did it just didn't sit right with me mm. and you know people kind of hold you to that that oh, I fought for a world title but it was over in two rounds or whatever you know so I really wanted to put a marker back on my name, put a bit of respect back on my name, and I believe that I did that with the last fight and the last performance, you know, in Madison Square Garden. That respect that you were felt a little bit of have been lost after that fight. Where was that? Because I think you know, in this country, people have huge admiration for the way you go about your business. Is that is that within boxing circles, or actually, is it in your head? Um, I think it could be a wee bit of both, to be honest. Um, like I'm a firm believer and you know I've really over the last couple of years tried to get to that place where I don't really let the opinion of others or anybody else's comments kind of hamper me or, or get to me but this is this is the sport that I do like you know I've done this sport since I was 11 10 years of age I've dedicated and sacrificed my whole life to this sport and to reach the pinnacle of fighting for a world title and coming away maybe not on the right end of it and kind of seeing that little bit of respect that little bit of uh, credit taken away because of the the result and the way the way that I lost that fight I suppose it just didn't sit too well with me and I think it was inside the boxing circle probably more so than outside the boxing circle um, but yeah I really wanted to, to you know to put that mark down again and to be like you know this is boxing these things mm. can happen like you know one shot can change everything and that's what happened then Draddy fight but you know I wanted to come back and show my worth show show people what, what I'm capable of and how good I am was that the first, am I right in saying that's the first time you've gone 12 rounds? Yeah, first time I've gone 12 rounds. Um, Is that a big difference? Like, how, or how did it feel to, to do it for the first time? It's actually kind of enjoyable. Right. I don't know anybody watching it. <laughs> I just, like the pain. Yeah, yeah, I might think a little bit different, but, you know, there's a there's a sense of, like, achievement going 12 rounds, like, because that is the championship mm. rounds, like, 12 rounds is championship <laughs> rounds. And... 
in terms of fitness wise and in terms of you know how you're feeling <laughs> it's just like you've done all the work in the gym and once it gets to that 10 round you know you've done 10 rounds for you like two rounds you always have two rounds in the bag like you know you can always pull it out of somewhere whereas for me you know uh, I, I think we got into the seventh or eighth round and i was like jesus is going you know this is going smooth like yeah. this is going feeling good fresh plenty of energy plenty of fitness about me so um yeah i loved uh, i enjoy going the 12 rounds now definitely does it does the fitness have to be do you have to ratchet that up a bit because you were in some nick like even in the, the weigh-ins and stuff uh, like maybe maybe similar to previous fights but certainly to the untrained eye it looked like you were in a serious nick <laughs> to be honest i kind of got asked this question um before you know a couple of days ago and it's been strange because i've actually not toned back my training mm. but have been more I suppose you could say more assertive with the training that I do do and I think that's the confidence in the team that I have around me you know whereas before I was always training you know you're always thinking that you have to be doing this and you know you, you, <laughs> resting was like something lazy do you know what I mean whereas resting is one of the most important things of your training mm -hmm. and if, if there is any young kids or anything out there watching this like it's not all about how much you do it's how good you do what you do do yeah do you know yeah, what yeah. i mean um and th and that was something for me like when i was growing up like all sometimes like i said dandy in this camp like i believe sometimes that maybe i was overtrained previously because and that's no fault to coaches or anything like that that's my own fault like always thinking that overtrained physically and mentally because always thinking that i gotta be going 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 all the time like taking a rest no that's no good you know you gotta keep pounding it all the time so for me um this the structure of the training kind of changed maybe not as many sessions but the sessions that i do do are 100 percent, and they're fully committed fully focused and i think that's what kind of got me into that fight and into into the way in the ring everything in such great shape because you know i was mentally fresh and physically fresh mm. i assume you're better conserving energy during a fight as well with a bit yeah. of experience Definitely, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're young and just want everything here now and just right in front of you, <laughs> you know, you can you can get caught up in the moment. Um, you can get caught up in things big time during a fight because in a fight, so many things can happen, so many things can can come into play that you're not ready for like cuts knockdowns um fight might be going the way that you thought it would be going mm. and that can panic fighters and, and yes it has panicked me in the past but you know i'm in a real great position now uh with the team that i have around me as i was saying you know great confidence great stability great foundation there that when i get in there now i know i have 12 rounds and in my last fight there like got knocked down I think it was the third round and right away I was like legs are good head's not dizzy boom I'm 100% right. looked into the corner dead on we're good like how much because uh, I've never stood in a ring and <laughs> I never intend to stand in a ring <laughs> well, I will get you in someday <laughs> uh, it wouldn't be good for anybody <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. last about three seconds uh, as I run out uh, how much thinking can you do in the ring like, how aware of you are you of your you know when you're in that zone when you're in the fight when you're in the three minutes in a round how aware of you of everything that's happening away from just the man stood in front of you um, I think that'll be different to every fighter that you talk to um, but for me, I suppose I can talk from early in my career and where I'm at now in my career. Whereas I remember, like, I would have heard every shout in the crowd or, you know, somebody ringside or, you know, been listening out for these kind of things. Whereas now I hear absolutely nothing. Wow, right. Like, I am just zoned in and just the blinkers on. All I'm worried about is the game plan that we've set out, who's in front of me. And how do I execute that? And is that just experience or is that something that you worked with with your team to not have those distractions? That is experience and stuff that I've worked on with my team. You know, this is stuff that we have worked on massively over the last probably two years. And I can really start seeing it coming to fruition now. Mm. You know, I can really start seeing it there's no other evidence than whenever you go and do it and you can feel it and you can see it and you can see the 
the positive side of it and the, the effects of it. So for me, it was um, it, it it definitely is something you know. Look, you always wish you had this early on in your career, but you'll never get to get these opportunities to have them unless you go through the times that you need to know right I need this in my career I need to do this or you know see the changes yourself I think you hit Berlanga with a, a strong right hand towards the end of the, the sixth round I think just before the bell and a good seventh round as well Like at that point are you thinking I could do this here yeah I think it was um, yeah I think it was the, the sixth round that I caught him with that right hand that they had a, <laughs> they had a lovely clip off <laughs> um, once the highlights read yeah definitely just put it and end up on his back <laughs> but that's the way it goes um, yeah you know I really felt that I was coming into it it was actually after the knockdown yeah that I think it's like in, in fights the fight sway so like when somebody knocks you down they're on a bit of a they're on a bit of a buzz mm-hmm. they think they have the upper hand and next thing after the knockdown and I come out to him and I have a strong posture I'm looking at him I'm like let's go here there's a fight on it can really change the dynamic because one minute he thinks that he has you down and out and gone and the next minute you're looking in front of him 10 seconds later ready to take his head off again <laughs> do you know so that can really swing the dynamic of a fight and I think that's what happened in that fight you know when whenever I got knocked down and, and got up and, and he's seen the he's seen the desire you know he's seen he's seen the fight in me and he knew that I wasn't going anywhere anytime soon so that was kind of when I think it swinged a little bit and I started getting on top I started out boxing and started landing my jab everything was starting to flow nicely mm. uh, coming into that and then having Andy in the corner of course as well you know so calm so collected you know and and that's the way maybe all our fighters are different but to get a message across to get your your fighter to listen to you to hear you you know if you come in roaring and shouting right away he's going to panic he's going to go all over the place he's going geez what's going on here Mm -hmm. whereas you know you come in and you sit down and you talk to him as if you're having a coffee and you know like that's when you start listening that's when you absorb that's when you take everything in and that is what Andy's so great at you know just getting the simple points across and it was so effective I thought some of the now uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong but a lot of the, the boxing journalists and people who have also watched the fight would have said a couple of the scorecards maybe a little bit um, dubious is, is one of the words I want to use so you were on the canvas four times two of those were in the final round but obviously he's going in search of a stoppage at this point and um, and even one of the knockdowns I could maybe call it yeah, dubious yeah, as yeah. well but so the final scorecards are 106, 108 106, 108 and 118, 106 um, stra- strange I think for anyone who's watched the fight and obviously we're coming from an Irish perspective but it did seem strange I, I don't know what your take yeah on like was. you know the zone like and Berlanga was the A side you know he was the matchroom debutant and mm. you know it was his big show in Madison Square Garden in, in New York and um, the zone actually had me I think it was level or up going into the last round. Right. Do you know what I mean? And that the difference. Like, do you know? Yeah. And this is a real controversial thing around boxing. Like, how do you score fights? Do mm. you know? Do you, do, you, do you score the aggressor? Do you score the the clean puncher? Um, it's so. I'm sure you know. Look, he's. Or, you see this kind of stuff happening all the time with you know people communicating with the the judges and the decisions and stuff like this here so it's it's something that we knew we were up against it mm. going into New York um, and going into Madison Square Garden where he's from because in two or three of his previous fights it's been similar <laughs> the fights have been a wee bit closer than the scorecards are suggesting but look there's only so much that I can control you know I can't control the judges I can't control what they think what they write down but the only thing I suppose that I can control is if I knock them out and take them out of their hands which obviously unfortunately didn't happen but you know I did did what I could and a lot of things did go in his favour and look I'll never make excuses or anything like that the the man won on the night um, but you know two of the knockdowns one of them definitely um, one of the other knockdowns mm. more like a, a push it kind of shoved down and it was counted a few low blows here and there that he was throwing in as well could have got a warning for and could have swung it the opposite way by me getting a few points but 
that's look the way it goes and, and you have to just kind of play the cards you're dealt there and then and now is I suppose the time that you kind of look back and see say what you really think yeah exactly you know uh, do you t- can you talk to the judges afterwards can you get feedback from them as to why they scored it a certain way I'm sure you can um, I have never done it um, I r- haven't really heard of anybody doing it yeah. but you know there's like there's a backstage where the commission and where the judges and referees and everybody hang out you could say like do you know what I mean so um, I'm sure you could and you see these judges and referees at fights I have a, I have a great relationship with a lot of the uh, referees um, over in California and any time you're at the fight you know you could meet them and you could easily say to them yeah. you know but one thing that, that, that I will say now when, when I'm here is that I would love to see in boxing like say before the fight judges instructions of being right it's going to be the aggressive fighter that we want to judge today or it's going to be the uh, clean puncher that we want to judge today it's going to be the quality of the shots not the quantity of the shots do you know and then after you're told this in advance the yes fight because I remember that this used to happen in um damage your setup mm. and there used to be a, a meeting for the judges before the actual competition whether it's the Europeans Worlds Olympics whatever it is there'd be a meeting and they'd be saying we're going to be scoring the body shots because body shots and computer scoring was never really scored mm. much and I remember one fight that I went in and scored like I was throwing body shots because I knew that was what they were going to be scoring and land a whole load of body shots and then the next fight I went in to land a whole load of body shots came in after the first round and not one of them was scored do you know so I would love I would love for judges and I know it's very difficult but I would love for judges or the boxing committees to come out and say you know on this show tonight we're going to be scoring like the aggressive yeah. fighter or the boxing fighter or whatever way that it is or just say what they're going to be looking for mm-hmm. and what the and then what the reasoning is behind their scoring you know after it is one of the most key things like why did you judge that fight that way mm. you know have like have like a referee ju- uh, a referee judge podcast yeah. after it like do you know what I mean to sit down I, I should have started that home nobody steals it nobody steals my idea yeah. there but you know have like a podcast or have like a a show whereas after a fight that judges and referees come down and explain it and you know it would be so insightful for boxers for coaches for managers for promoters for the general public then watching it as well mm. it's an interesting one that, that that would definitely clear a lot of things up for yeah. boxing fans even <laughs> but then would it be as much crack then where you couldn't get on Twitter and if, start if slagging maybe, knew what was going, <laughs> yeah, yeah. maybe the fairest results was called in every fight yeah. what would we talk you about know? then you're uh, what you just turned 32 was it yeah just turned 32 uh, so you're at that stage that uh, if there is a defeat you know what questions are going to yeah, be coming yeah, afterwards at the way you've been talking suggests that retirement isn't on the cards yeah so obviously um, 32 years of age now and recently married you know getting into that stage of my life now where it's time to settle down put the feet up and (laughs) all that carry on but for me um, don't get me wrong there has been stages you know especially after the Andrade fight and stuff like that where I was like but that was more like when you're on the downer you're like I just they want to say it online but mm, yeah. have the sort of thing you know what I mean um, what's the point in it and all that there but those are stages that you, you go through um, but with my last fight as soon as I touched down in Dublin on my way home and the whole drive back to Donegal all I wanted to do was just get back in the gym <laughs> and keep working on what me and Andy, Shane, Gary, Sean, the whole team has been working on throughout the whole training camp. It was like, it, it was it was kind of like the, that, that it was a sport that I just started, that I was learning again. Right. You know, that I was like, right, I want to, because I know I can do this better. And, and in that fight, I did put up a great performance, I did do well, all that there kind of stuff was said about it but coming away from that fight I know I have another couple of gears in me Mm. and I never really seen that before in any of my previous fights whereas this one I seen 
you know, if I can continue these training camps, continue fighting frequently, I know I can get another few gears out of me. And I think that is just kind of what with the team that we we have around us now, and I suppose the the structure that we have going now that everything is really starting to fall into place. Um, and as I says, like all I wanted to do was get back in the gym. Like and me and Andy were we went back into the gym yesterday morning. You know, did a few things and just kind of went over some of the stuff that we that we did do well in the fight and you know on the pads and, and it just felt good like you know as it says it feels like I'm learning something again and I have a real kind of desire to get even better and I never thought I'd be saying this at 32 years of age and at this stage of my career it's but incredible I, really isn't it like, yeah. I don't think anyone who's ever come into contact with Andy Lee hasn't come away from a conversation yeah, yeah. feeling <laughs> yeah. better about themselves yeah, yeah, and better yeah. about life but the way you're talking about him throughout this conversation it, it yeah. sounds as though he's had a huge impact on you I never really, um, I never really, I suppose, understood or realized the effect that he did have on me until he was actually there mm. in America with me for that fight. Um, because, you know, when you're in LA and you're, you know, doing a lot of it on your own, do you know what I mean? You're, you're kind of calling the shots about where you're going to eat and where you're going to train and do this here like because in professional boxing you're kind of your own boss sometimes and the kind of final say is on you whereas this time around you know with Andy Shane Gary Sean we, we had a great full team April was even there you know part of the team and it was just fell into place lovely and Andy you know was I don't want to say taking control, but you know he was calling the shots in terms of like where we would eat, you know, where we would go training, you know, what time we doing this, what time. Whereas all that just took the the mental energy uh, off of me, like you know, trying to think mm. about this, trying to think about that. Whereas I was just able to chill in the room with April, watch a bit of Netflix. Like, it was, it was yeah, relax. yeah, and and that's the positive distractions that you need, and that's something that me and Shane have been working on, you know, in between, like you don't need to be hemmed up about the fight 24 7 because you'll be drained like you know you just need to be switched on ready to go whenever the time comes and uh, Shane O'Sullivan he's a um a good friend of mine firstly that we have uh, we have on the team now um sports psychology and everything you know so uh, Shane's been been a massive addition to the team as well and uh, yeah we've all blended in brilliantly together and we had a look it was a great week in New York you know, we really had uh, we really had good fun as well while we were there. Uh, we enjoyed it. You know, the 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 face off, the press conferences. It was probably my first time as well coming up somebody that's mouthy like. <laughs> and what was he saying? Uh, he was just he, honest to God. Like he wasn't making sense at all. Anytime he was speaking, like he was, like one of the things that he kept saying to me was, oh, "This is my city. This is my city." Like, and I don't know, like. I did geography at school, like, but I don't know. Was he trying to give me a geography lesson? Like, I knew it was in New York. I knew he was from New York, yeah. uh, and he just kind of kept saying this stuff over and over again. But it was. Uh I actually really enjoyed it. Like, I, I really, really enjoyed. Came a bit back. I did, like, but kind of not in a in a mouthy way. Like, I just, you know, like I was like, I know what you're saying. Like, well, take him, like, to, take him to Valley Buffet for the rematch and just be like, this is my town. Ah, uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> take, him, take him back over here. Yeah. This is this is McCool Park. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> the wind blows around. Uh, and what else? He, he kind of said something to you know. He was just like he loves to talk and he loves to be out there. And I spoke to him after it, and we. It's part of the game, you know, the, the hype and the build up yeah. and all that there. I spoke to him after it. Lovely fella, down to earth, good skin, do you know what I mean? But you know, in the build up to it and all, he's like, Yeah, and, and Ireland's my city and all like, I'm like it's not a city like <laughs> <laughs> Ireland's my city. <laughs> do you know but like that's a laugh in his face. Yeah. It's um but it was good. I really enjoyed, you know, the, the, the face off and it was it brought an extra, an extra bit of excitement and bite to it, so yeah. definitely. You've been great with your time, Jason. I, I, I guess you're looking for that. I know the Shane Mosley fight was a couple of years ago now, but th that famous scenes where you dropped to your knees, and like, yeah. I know the crowd was a bit eerie in Vegas because of the, I think COVID was only yeah, yeah, kind of yeah. coming to an end. I suppose you want a repeat of that moment, but with, with yeah, with, with definitely. Plenty more fans. You know, we're we're in this for glory. Like, do you know what I mean? We're not in here just to just to show up and give it a go like we're, we're in here for glory and yeah 
those are those are the nights that that, that I that I want back and that I believe like boxing is a sport that if you do not believe that you can have glory nights and you cannot be successful get the hell out of there like mm. you know it's not a sport to be to be in there for the sake of it or to say I'm a boxer or to say you know anything boxing is it's a very difficult sport um, and it's something that you need to have confidence in yourself to, to stick at it and to go at it and you know I've really found a new a new kind of lease of confidence and a lease of uh I suppose progression mm. that as I says you know I never thought I'd be saying this at, at this stage of my career and at this age like but yeah it's uh, it's exciting yeah sounds like that drive from Dublin Airport to Donegal and lock something <laughs> I definitely you definitely in your yeah, head yeah yeah uh, listen Jason always a pleasure thanks nice for, one. Thanks thank for you me. Slad thank you for having me in we'll catch up again no doubt, no, no doubt very soon down the line before the next one maybe 100% for that right great stuff uh, Jason Quigley there Donegal Boxer great chat as per usual on tomorrow's show tomorrow Thursday myself and Kathleen will be with you bringing you a plenty of preview of Ireland versus France with Maeve de Burka we'll have All-Ireland Hurling semi-final build-up as well with uh, voices from both Galway and Limerick and we'll preview Claire Kilkenny on Friday's show as well Jess Kelly after coming home from Wimbledon and Paul Howard you had to be there live in studio right now another Dunny Gallman Brendan Deveni from last night's show have a wonderful Wednesday in the meantime though we are turning to Gaelic football so uh, we neglected, in particular, Derry on our analysis yesterday. And my apologies, Derry, we just ran out of time. The other game is very absorbing and uh, Derry Cork wasn't a classic. So we probably skated by it relatively quickly. And maybe we didn't give Monaghan their due credit either. So I'm very happy to say Mr. Brendan Deveni is uh, with us for uh, something of an Ulster perspective ahead of this Kerry Dublin final. What about you, Joe? Yeah, <laughs> listen, uh, we don't want to jump the gun, but uh, after the weekend, yeah, all the, all the uh, indicators are pointing that way. But we had a bad season, uh, Joe, so it's very, very hard to tell. Was this just one of those brilliant performances from the two, from the two sides? It's hard to know. We've seen some unbelievable performances throughout the championship from teams that, that shouldn't have won on certain days. So I suppose that's what Monaghan and Derry are going to look to do, upset the odds. As I mentioned there, we started yesterday with Mayo Dublin, talked about that for plenty, and then did similar on Kerry's win, and then Monaghan and Armagh was so dramatic. And we pretty much skated by Cork 1-8, Derry 1-12, which it must be said wasn't a thrilling spectacle. Derry had their first score after 10 minutes. By half an hour, Cork had scored three points. So it wasn't quite the Dublin Mayo kick fest that we might um, have enjoyed a touch more. That said, Derry are here in a semi-final. They're uh, not happy with the they can't do it in Crow Park line and they have Kerry in their crosshairs. So give us a word on, on Derry's performance against Cork. It was very, um, well, for want of a better word, talking about GEA players, it was very professional, very controlled. Yeah, and I think that's how Derry play. It's, it's what they've been doing this last number of years. There's a real pattern to, to how they play. Um, maybe over defensive uh, last season when they got up there they realised they had to tweak some things and they certainly are flooding and committing players forward and probably off the back of last year you're looking are they any better I mean in squad terms of course the, the brilliant McFall is back we haven't seen the best of him yet really I think he's slowly coming up to the pitch of, of where county football is at we've seen some flashes of brilliance from him uh, I just remember a few weeks back on the points he had in Bal Buffet uh, right in the almost on the end and he swiveled in a ball and put it over the bar pure class but I think McAvoy the fullback allowing like up in that point Rogers was circling in and out depending on what team they were playing but now him and Glass formidable midfield and that comes down to McAvoy being solid in that defence of course like Lock and Murray coming in there as well so I think Derry from earlier in the season you've seen both elements to the game they still had that rigid zonal type uh, marking their, their tackling was good their turnovers were solid but they did look like they were breaking but a lot more uh, pace and trying to open up the pitch keeping players wide pushing players into the end line realising that the other sides were going to set up similar to them and they were going to have to learn to break them down so very much coming on the radar Joe you know they, they, they won Ulster and there was very little talk about it I mean such a barren spell they had as, as we all know going right into Division 4 and then 
you know, they won back to back Ulsters because of the nature of this season with the league and the championship. There's so little talk really about the provincials, even something like an Ulster, which was massive for them. I mean, Armagh, like so desperate for one. And, and listen, they went through the group stages without anybody talking to them. And again, as you just mentioned there, Joe, a very um, workmanlike performance, you know, never had the heights against Cork. I mean, Cork, 22 efforts from goal only at one eight from that yeah. you know they were pretty poor so there you know coming in a wee bit on the radar um, I think probably coming into the championship you, you would have had uh, Dublin Kerry I think Galway just tucked in behind them you then had uh, the, the likes of um, uh, Mayo you know you were thinking maybe Tyrone and then Derry that's probably where a lot of people would have had that mark and so listen they, they, they certainly have a chance uh, uh, going into the game and how do Kerry size up for them? Certain matchups work, certain styles work, others don't. Will they like the look of what, <laughs> in so much as you can like what Kerry are about, but will they uh, feel they can get at Kerry? Is that a matchup that suits what Derry have in their locker? Yeah, well, Derry do some good at snuffing out the opposition. They, you know, I know obviously there's been, been a change there with, with Gar stepping down and, and Mina stepping up to the, to the main job, but, you know, we certainly well got there. He's, he's a huge uh, number of years done with these, these dairy lads he was involved with the last uh, dairy management so listen he's been around the block with these guys and they trust him and and uh, yeah matchups is interesting if you, if you look at it now the way teams drop off you know you what, what matchups is important but still you would say you know the likes obviously of uh, of, uh, of McCaig uh, and and his and his battle is going to happen inside with um, with uh, Kerry full forward um, whose name has just left my brain for some reason of, of all names to, to leave my you're, you're, my head you Clifford, haven't forgotten David Clifford, Clifford's name I presume no no I haven't I haven't you know what I was thinking about all the other matchups as he said it to me and I'd bypassed that one my brain was I, I, I tell you what Brennan <laughs> you want to keep an eye out for this David Clifford kid I think he's going to go all the way <laughs> that's, that's bad that's a brain but no I, I tell you there is a, probably a couple of matchups and I say White had a brilliant game for Kerry last day Cassidy you know is, is adept at, at handling and tracking a player like that if he's going to have a huge influence up the pitch I would say probably fully McGuigan you know when you look at the two ends of the pitch, you know, Clifford, Clifford McKay, probably Foley McGuigan, you know, uh, you know, you know, maybe Tom Sullivan, but I think probably Foley will pick him up. And then you have the brilliant battle. I mean, the last day O'Connor, uh, everybody's raving about his performance and, and Barry at midfield. The, the, that against Glass and Rogers, I suppose there is very intriguing battles in there, but in many ways, what would have happened from a few years previous, so the, the, the tactics that have come in their sport have been a result of lesser teams really wanting to beat better teams and how do they get about them and how do they frustrate them and how do they stop them playing what you have is now is the better teams are now all playing the same they've all got it locked down um, probably you just leave Mayo out let Ferrer or Mayo or Mayo yeah. but everybody else so, and you've seen it the last day once Dublin and Kerry went into that league so your fear is in the semi-final is that if Dublin and Kerry start to flex their muscles and go go a good few points up four or five points up they just sit and they play like an out and out counter-attacking team and it's, it's horrible for the opposition so I think that's a big thing for Derry that, that it isn't a case of and you've seen it be thrown the last day maybe from a couple of years ago how they went about them and after after Kerry and, and, and you know Kerry tried this a few times under Peter, Peter Keane and it just was all a wee bit miserable Jack O'Connor you know brings in Paddy Talley they find the right ingredients so you have that rigid defence that man to man tackling but then you have the breaking with pace mm. that's what Dublin did so well and Derry obviously got the defensive side right Joe and still there is question marks can they punch enough scores going forward against the, against the side of Kerry I've heard people say that if you were to pick anyone to try and marshal David Clifford there's a chance McCaig might be top of your list if you could pick anyone in the country now I still sort of don't fancy anyone's chances against Clifford admittedly he scored a point from play the last day I doubt he's going to do that two games in a row so <laughs> McCaig versus Clifford does he have half a chance here at keeping this guy to three four points yeah it's so funny Joe how, how we talk about Clifford uh, and, and you, you you talk about a guy hitting five points and he if I can away from Crow Park with five points one mark one from play I've had three frees I'm pretty happy with yeah. McCaig's work and, yeah. and we're, we're, we're looking at this guy going you know he's had an off day I mean his pass for the, which led to the goal you know we, we, we've been raving about as well so I'm thinking with Clifford you know I would say he probably likes days like that that 
he's contributed brilliantly to the goal with a, with a bit, bit of unbelievable skill. He's kind of done his job mm. uh, again, probably in a, in a workman league, and he hasn't set the world on fire. I mean, there was there was a free pull back. Remember the one he planted in the net too? And I was just looking yeah, back at it. Yeah, should have there. been an advantage. The advantage should have been played. And, and you look at the ease that he put that ball in the corner of that net too. I mean, player people just can't do that. Normal forwards just can't do that. He just strokes that ball into the back of the net. So your fear would be uh, if he gets if he gets a run uh, against Derry. But as you said, McKeague, unreal. He had probably one slip of Bosch and Gillen in, in Bal Buffet uh, in one of the games of his life now. And maybe that small bit of youth and pace uh, against him. Maybe, listen, Chris, he's been there a long, long time. Mm. But I don't think Clifford is overly uh, fast in that terms. He obviously is unbelievably physical. So I think, yeah, that's that's uh, set for, for a huge battle and uh, that'll have a, a massive bearing in the game. Monaghan and Armagh after extra time had 14 points apiece and then we had the penalties which were very dramatic unlike large quotients of the game we had uh, Darren O'Sullivan on yesterday and Colin Boyle they were doing our analysis and I gave it the old uh, cliched thoughtless question uh, presenters ask people in these circumstances I said God you'd feel very sorry for Armagh and it was interesting Darren O'Sullivan was so strong and, 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 and pointed on it he said I don't feel sorry for them at all they got everything they deserved they have the forwards to actually play really good football and to go out and win games and this policy almost of stay in the game tactics is not going to get them anywhere and I've no sympathy for them none so I have to say I kind of do look at the cards that McGinney has to play in that forward line and would love him to play a few more of them so what's your read on, on how they're to feel about this season his ninth in charge yeah, listen, it's been a, a mass. You'd have to say they are on the up and up. I mean, they're down as far as Division 3. You know, the beginning from, from Armagh dominating, particularly in Ulster. Then they couldn't win a game in Ulster. You know, obviously Donaghy came in there, the backroom team, and they really looked like they were going somewhere. I mean, the Ulster final. If you look at the three penalty shooters, so it's just thinking about those players. Most of them have been on this journey all together uh, with McGinney since they've started to get back into a, a Division 1 a competing team. You know, if they won those three penalty they shoot out. So they're in All-Ireland semi-final last year. Who knows what would have happened? They've won Ulster and they're in All-Ireland semi this year. And it completely changes everything about those players' careers, basically. Because it, who knows what's going to happen after this? So it's on the back of those three penalty shootouts. You know, our, the Arma world could be so, so different. But it is what it is. And if you're on about normal time, so yeah, and we're crying out the Arma about this all year. So when I, I take this back to, I was doing a commentary Arma against uh, Tyrone and, and uh, Arma playing so, so in the match they have a man sent off and they realised the game's over and Throne were keeping the ball and they started to squeeze on Throne with a man down and turnovers and cause mayhem and push Throne and, and very easily could have got a goal at the end of the match which would have got them a draw and, and you're looking saying why aren't our mad with 14 men they were able to put Throne under massive pressure and you're like right that's from football football that, that's how we attack the game and if you look at our man's physicality and their ability to play is if they're sitting you know with the power that they have they're a much more physically uh, stronger team than, than Monaghan and Heightways anyway so you're thinking why didn't you put the squeeze on Monaghan and, and particularly we, we, we obviously know with a black card sitting and waiting to win a game by a point and listen it nearly came off Joe but then you had that come with there the man McManus again <laughs> wham bam hey, this man uh, talk about vintage Joe and, and, and listen came the penos in and it's that lottery so looking back at it now was there a couple of goal opportunities in there maybe Arma could have went for him we were talking about Clifford a minute ago Grugan coming in there you know that left foot has you know a goal at, at a stage in that match I think with a catapult at Armadi victory but that's a man and a plucky they hung in there what's next for, for Armadi it's difficult uh, because it's a huge ask to, to keep playing that way because I think that negative style of football kind of grinds teams down after a while and with our man not getting the success they would have wanted it's definitely going to come back uh, year on year yeah you have to have the success to make that worthwhile you do, you do. And I, I think, too, there's a lifespan with playing that real rigid, rigid football because at the end of the day, it's not enjoyable. I mean, everybody's a defender first. And I think you're seeing that with Derry. In fairness to them this year, they are at times. I know when, when they get under their defensive shape, they're still as, as bad or as rigid as ever, depending on how you look at it. But yeah. they are trying to open up that bit more. And I think we are mad. 
they keep on having their best players back in and it's basically players of the quality of Ryan O'Neill to have them so like almost playing a half back no. for the majority of the game it doesn't, it doesn't work and you see like O'Neill's kick when they need it and you're like oh my god I mean four or five more of these a, a half would be just fine yeah. is there any sense that we're being a touch harsh on Armad though maybe they don't have the firepower we're saying they do have maybe McGinney sees it close up and he's got a stronger sense of their abilities I, I say that because it's my instinctive reaction watching them but it's pretty easy for me on the couch as I sip a cup of tea McGinney is super smart it, like it emanates from him Kieran Donaghy is an attack minded player coach I would think super smart I would think they spend I'd love to see their phone bills I'd say they're talking the whole time plotting like and I'm just here going oh you know why don't you attack more and, and a part of me thinks I may be doing them a big disservice so are we being a touch harsh on them as well? Well I, I think from the year previous uh, when when we were getting infused about our man don't forget it's not you know, they're only just really come back in this point where they, they, they were challenged and they were getting back yeah. to Crow Park and the way they, they dismantled particularly last year what they did to, to, to Rowan what they did to Donegal they really went for them uh, for the juggler and you had all this firepower and all this aggression and for some reason they dropped back then you know, and earlier in the season I remember talking about this and I could only think were they getting ready maybe to, to possibly look at a trajectory of meeting Derry in the Ulster final and that's how we have to play to beat them uh, because Ulster was so important for them but yet we've seen so many instances of it you know, particularly in the league really down in Killarney you know, when, when, when they should have won the match but their defensive uh, regression really killed them in the game and mm. in many ways our man in the league uh, the couple of results could have flipped so easily they could have been at the top of the league they end up getting relegated I thought the penny would have dropped a bit then uh, Joe in terms yeah. of how they approach the game but it didn't happen mm. so that brings us to Mona and you mentioned McManus and it is I mean I think everybody in the country you couldn't but be happy for McManus and I don't know which point it was I think he scored four in total but there was one earlier on where it's such a clever little jink the way he feigns to hop the ball one way and pops back onto his left and finds a bit of space and calm as you like I mean silky smooth over the bar and then the way he won the free the way he took the free under those circumstances glorious I think his hips are giving him trouble he's been on the go a long time and no one likes sitting on the bench but I mean he gets his moment in the uh, sun he's a finisher not a sub <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> that, I do. That's, that's a great way of, of, of putting that down, yeah. Uh, I seen him come on a few weeks back, uh, as I say, up against Donegal, and, and Mono were really poor in the night. That Donegal played well. I won't take anything away from him, yeah. but this is a Donegal team who, who you know, we're, we're missing so many players in that. And looking at that Mono team, there seems to be this issue. There's real up and down with them. I think when they've got a bit of an axe to grind or some reason to come at teams, I mean, you look at the way Derry uh, um, took them apart in Ulster, and then when they played them, they in the first group game you know, it was a completely different mana and their grace and the way they attacked the game probably should have beat Derry in Celtic Park you know Derry showing a bit of metal in that game so there's something about mana and you know and, and their smaller population and how they're set up I mean Vinnie Corey takes that job I don't think he necessarily wanted it so soon but there was nobody really coming in for it uh, as we've seen with a few jobs around here and, and Martin Corey his brother coming in very highly regarded coach you know in the, in the area and the lads love him you look at the likes of Vinnie how long he played you know Paul Finley, the Hugheses, you know, you look at McManus, there's a real club sense uh, you always get with Monaghan that everybody's in there for the long haul. Nobody yeah. retires until the very last. They say, McManus has had some sure in years to come, we'll give him bar, but he can always play back those couple of penalties and uh, those frees <laughs> he had and, and he can uh, have a smile to himself. I find it really hard. I like they've made fools of us all and they should have been relegated about 15 times at this stage and, and just <laughs> yeah. haven't been find it really hard to make the case against Dublin yeah yeah um, th listen Dublin Joe you, you're, you're again looking at the right time of the season just to be hitting the, the right points and this if, if Dublin were, were like a soccer team and you see it with the dominant teams over there that have the best players and keep the ball there's a different way of playing your blood needs to be up properly to play football and I know that's lessened over time with tactics and possession but you still need to have a bite and you're looking at Dublin and looking at them earlier in the year against Roscommon and I was thinking about the Roscommon dressing room before they were to play them 
you know, we hadn't won a game at Crow Park at so long and the fans had Dublin, they were they must have been hopping. It was the Dublin lads I would say there was something Frank Bo playing in the dressing room, it's just another game. What, what are we having so, for dinner tonight? Well <laughs> taking the woman. Um listen, that that's the thing Joe, and, and that's no disrespect to Ross Common, but when you've been so successful and been around the block, how do you get up for certain games? And yeah. I think that's something that Desi Farrell struggled with and people were kind of blaming him for it, which was very unfair because you know, as he said himself the last day, they've had 22 new players in the last two years, and then all the experience comes back in this year, Joe. And how they finished that game was absolutely frightening. And you know, you look at last year with those players missing, you know, Mannion, Com was injured, uh, McCaffrey wasn't there, Clux wasn't there against Kerry, the kill still nearly beat Kerry. So you'd think just that Crow Park thing, uh, uh, Joe, that Dublin now are, are getting ready, and uh, that that's an unbelievably horrible proposition for Monaghan and again. If Monaghan go behind, not like it was years ago, you know, there, there isn't that chance to maybe hit them for 1-2 or 1-3, catch them sleeping. Dublin will just sit in rigid and keep hitting you on the counter and, and all the banks in the exposure. Mm. Uh, Joe and Cork, who I, I suspect was watching the Derry game very closely, said Cork were jaded after three weeks on the bounce. They had lots of chances. Derry made seriously hard work if they wouldn't be so sure about them. And Pat makes a fair point. I hadn't thought about this actually, but now that he says it, I totally agree. Uh, the goalie, I presume he's talking about Monaghan goalie here. The goalie should not be allowed to wear black. Gets mixed up with the referee. That is true. There's a few times he popped up on my screen and I thought, bloody hell, ref. Oh no, goalie. But that's a, that's an aside, that point. On Dublin, we were saying last night, you mentioned all the lads have come back. Uh, the sense from the likes of Paddy Andrews and different Dublin players in the know is that genuinely, as much as you know, uh, people laugh at us, there is a lean period coming behind this generation. Like it, There isn't the next Con coming through, the next McCaffrey coming through. So there seems to be a real sense. The band is back together. We're going to win one more All-Ireland potentially and, and maybe there will be a, a, a lean-ish by Dublin standards period. So they have, they just have that short-termism about them Dublin at the moment, which is a bit scary and mm. to your point they'll have adrenaline for the semi-final so you know that makes them a bit scary who wins the All-Ireland? Yeah do you know what I just have a feeling it's going to be Dublin and, and as you said just the performances of the last day of, of Fenton McCarthy the, 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 the players that yeah. they brought off the bench they assured you Cluxton you know um, listen 173 points in that second half I mean that's an absolute destruction of a side that we thought it was going to be close you know when I take your, your, your text there's point there about the fatigue that last that last game in the group stages was what really caused problems for so many teams mm. I mean Donegal beat Monaghan Kildare beat Ross Common you know the draw uh, to Ronan Westmeath listen Cork uh, beating Mayo you know the, uh, Armagh beating Galway mm. all these performances we didn't see coming and then it caused another game for a lot of those teams which I think then led them into games not completely uh, uh, ready, uh, ready you know yeah. in the quarterfinals where they weren't expecting to be I think that threw up a lot up in that point we, we were trying to figure out where is everybody in this championship but after last weekend Joe, there's no doubting uh, where the power that be lie and it's it's still very much we carry in Dublin I know there's a sense now it was all a lot of shadow boxing and those boys circled first weekend of July and boom here we are it's Kerry in Dublin of course it's Kerry in Dublin Should, you know what were we expecting we uh, you didn't answer my question oh you said Dublin you said Dublin you think it'll be Dublin okay well yeah. uh, we'll watch the next couple of weeks it's nice to have uh, the championship really uh, booming at the moment thank you so much appreciate OTB AM the sports breakfast show from off the OTB AM. It's OTB AM, the sports breakfast show from off the ball with you live as per usual until.